at it too. All right. Um, so I have uh, some prepared remarks um, and a few announcements. Um, I doubt that I will take the the full 10 minutes um, on the agenda, but uh, that's fine because um, in that case, we should be able to reclaim a bit of meeting time. Um, so without further ado, welcome to the 2023 fall gathering of the Wisconsin Green Party. Today, we gather not just as members, but as custodians of a future that demands our immediate and concerted action. Our theme, genocide and ecocide, time to act, underscores the urgency of the crises we face. The existential threat of climate change and the profound human and environmental tragedies unfolding in Gaza. Our discussions today will delve into these critical issues, exploring transformative environmental actions to combat ecological collapse, and addressing the complex interplay of human rights and environmental sustainability, particularly in conflict zones. This gathering also marks a pivotal moment for our party. We are at the threshold of making significant bylaw changes, enhancing the inclusivity and democracy of our decision-making processes. These changes, reflecting our commitment to transparency and member empowerment, will allow all dues paying members to vote online, regardless of their physical presence at meetings, and ensure local chapters and identity caucuses have the ability to fill vacancies on the coordinating council between membership meetings. Furthermore, today we will nominate candidates for key party positions. It's a time to hear diverse voices and visions, shaping the leadership that will guide us forward. Let's use this opportunity to reinforce our commitment to peace, justice, democracy, and ecology. Here today, let's connect, share ideas, and foster a Green Party that is robust, inclusive, and ready to face the challenges of our times. Your insights and contributions are invaluable as we collectively strive to grow our party and support movements aligned with our core values. Thank you for joining us today. Your participation is a powerful testament to our shared dedication to creating a sustainable and equitable world. Uh, so with that, I will, uh, I have a few announcements that I'd like to make. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dave Schwab uh, for his service as co-chair. Uh, over the past several years. Um, he has provided leadership to the party um, through difficult times and has um, frequently uh, stood as a voice of calm and reason at those times. I'd also like to thank Bill Braham for uh, his service as operations treasurer. Um, Bill, uh, and, and I'd also like to um, bid Bill a friendly uh, farewell um, as he uh, will not be running for re-election. Uh, Bill has, again, been a voice of calm and reason and somebody who I have grown to respect deeply um, during the time that I've served with them on the Wisconsin Green Party Coordinating Council. Uh, so with that said, um, to more uh, bookkeeping um, types of affairs, uh, so due to the number of uh, Wisconsin Green Party members who have RSVP'd for this meeting, uh, and also a number of uh, folks who are not um, members of the party, we will be reserving speaking time during this meeting for members of the Wisconsin Green Party. Uh, we will be utilizing a stack process as we do uh, with our meetings. So if you want to speak, you'll want to call stack in the meeting chat. 
that will place you on the speaker queue. When it's your turn to speak, you'll be asked to unmute. You can speak for up to three minutes, but I'd like to ask um, if folks can to try to keep their comments to around a minute or less, just because we have so many folks here and wanna make sure that everybody's able to, to provide input. If you have already spoken, um, attendees who have not yet spoken may be prioritized on the stack to allow everybody to speak. Um, if you are hosting a hybrid setup, uh, I just want to provide a reminder that um, you're responsible for maintaining that space. So be mindful of audio issues and try to avoid disruption, um, disruptions during the meeting. Um, on the off chance there are repeated disruptions um, that may result in revocation of stack privileges um, and or removal from the meeting, depending on um, on the nature of, of the disruption. Uh, finally, um, all members in good standing will be receiving ballots uh, to provide input on the bylaws uh, amendments that we have up for vote, uh, as well as to vote in our internal elections. Those ballots will be going out at midnight uh, tonight. So by tomorrow morning, they should be in everybody's inbox. Um, and if there are any issues with those ballots, you find that you haven't received a ballot, um, but you're a member in good standing, please reach out and we will get the situation uh, resolved in a timely manner. Uh, so with that said, um, those are uh, those are all the announcements which I have prepared. Um, we're running slightly ahead ahead of schedule, uh, and we do have a speaker scheduled for twelve twenty, Murray Borello. So. Um, if Murray is prepared, um, we could move directly into that portion of the meeting. No problem. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to um, just set you up as a co-host temporarily. This should allow you to share your presentation. If you have any issues with that, just let me know. And I will um, go ahead and I can um, share it on your behalf. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, I am going to attempt to share for a sec here. Let's see if that does it. Let's do, we can go ahead with desktop. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Whoops. Hmm. I got to do that again. Hold on. Um, here we go. Open systems. Okay. So it's not sharing. Do you see you do see my screen? There we go. Now, now let me try it one more time. I did send this to Joe. So um, I did send it on to Sam and David. Did you, did you get that email, Sam David? Yes. Yeah, I can I can present the um the presentation. Uh, just one moment, and I will get that pulled up and the uh, screen share going. Yeah, I don't know why I got a had to get a new computer, and it didn't. It's been very messy on Zoom. 
while you're doing that, I'll start because um, I want to leave a lot of time for questions. So um, I am uh, the director and uh, chair of the Environmental Studies Program at Elma College, and that is the alma mater of the one and only uh, Joe Kingfisher, and I will not share any bad stories about him, uh, but if you want to email me later, you can. There um, are none. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Borello. Um, uh, I'm just wondering if you uh, would like to turn on your video or, or if you'd prefer not to, just to let um, you know. There we go. I can turn it on. It's up to you. Do, 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 do. Hey, we see you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hey, everybody. So, um, because of the time change, because I screwed up, um, that you're actually on um, Central Time, um, I definitely have to be done by 12.20, or you're one twenty. but I think that's more time than what you want from me anyway, so I think we're good. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to kind of dive into this. Uh, Joe had sent me a bunch of questions that uh, people had, and there's no possible way I could have put that all into this. Uh, presentation, but uh, what I tried to do is I tried to set up the um, framework of the presentation such that uh, when I'm done, you get a sense of whether I've answered the question or you can bring the question um, a lot easier. So anyway, next slide. Or can I do it? Can I control it? That would be great if I could. Uh, I don't think that she'll be able to control it just because I'm sharing it from my end. Oh, there uh, you go. But I did move to the next slide, so. Okay, I don't see it. <laughs> our, let, me, our... let me turn off my video only because I may save some bandwidth there. Maybe that'll help. So, hmm, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I got to see where I am here. Uh, so Sam can change the presentation at Murray's prompt, right? Yes, I can. Are other people able to see the presentation? I, I can see what, it. Do you see the title slide or do you see the next, the second slide? Uh, there's some people that say they can't. They only see the title slide. There we go. Um, so it is slow. Yeah, there we go. Keep, yeah. You want me just to go. reveal there the full? Go. Okay. There you go. So what I see is the, the slide that overviews the main points. Okay, great. Let's see if we can get this guy rolling here. Um, these are the points that I'm going to make. Uh, we are, as a scientist, I can tell you that we're way over the climate change is real thing, and we're really focusing on uh, what does that mean? And mostly what it means is that climate change is exacerbating already existing environmental and, and economic and social justice issues, which we'll talk about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Anthropocene, the part of it where we talk about um, uh, uh, extinction. And I do think there's hope, but honestly, I think the window of opportunity is closing very fast. And so We'll talk a little bit about the political, social political part of this too. Next slide. All right. All right, that's good. Next slide. So let's dive into this. So we're going to start as a scientist, thinking as a scientist. So we're not talking about Jewish space lasers for starting forest fires. We're going to talk from reproducible, testable, methodological, evidence-based kind of um, knowledge. So the first thing we would, should ask is, are we actually warming? And, and that's very easy to do. We can get uh, records uh, from ice cores, or we can just get records from uh, people who take uh, official readings of temperature records, and we can and do a quick average for each year and then plot it. And yes, we are warming, as you can see. Next slide. But it's not just the warming that we really are worried about right now. Um, we so so this is just to show you that this is not part of a cycle. 
Uh, we can go back 800,000 years with ice cores, but this is a unique sort of thing. Next slide. And what makes it unique is that it is an unprecedented rate of warming. Next slide. So what we see is as we take data um, from, uh, this is 150 years, the closer we get to today, you can see the averages uh, start to get, uh, the, these average lines get steeper. We are now warming the planet faster than at any time in the history of the world. That's four and a half billion years. We are doing uh, what the earth has not ever done as far as we know. Next slide. So the take home message is yes, we are warming. The rate at which the Earth's average global temperature is, is increasing and that is unprecedented. Next slide. I'm kind of running through there. So a lot of climate deniers will say, and, and this is okay because science needs to be able to answer questions. So how is it warming? And so if we discount the Jewish space laser hypothesis, there's really only four ways that you can uh, warm a planet. Uh, you can increase solar output, you can move the earth closer to the sun. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and you can increase the internal heat, the geothermal gradient coming to the surface, or um, what we all know is you can increase uh, heat trapping greenhouse gases. Next slide. So when scientists have looked at this, um, despite what maybe is on internet or Facebook or whatever, uh, we've been measuring solar output for 200 years, and uh, we do see cycles, but they do not correlate with the surface global surface temperatures. They're unrelated, and the general net output of the sun has not changed. And so there is no this this can't be a, a reason why we're warming. Next slide. So the Earth doesn't get closer to the sun. Well, it sort of does, but um, we would have to break some laws of gravitational mechanics, but it does wobble, it precesses. So it, it changes its tilt and we know that it does that. Uh, but we also know we can measure that. It takes a long time for it to do it, far longer than what would account for the warming trend that we see right now. So this can't be a uh, reason, next. And um, geologists have been looking at the geothermal gradient, the heat engine from the core, and are we seeing any fluctuation in that? And believe it or not, we've known for a long time that it is very stable, probably stable from 2.5 billion years ago till today. So this isn't it. So that only leaves um, the greenhouse gases. So let's go to the next slide and see if we've actually increased greenhouse gas. So we have. Um, go to the next slide. Carbon dioxide we talk about a lot because it is the most abundant uh, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, but other greenhouse gases have also increased over time. Next slide. So we have another take home message that says that this the only scientific explanation for why we're warming has to be greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are increasing. Next slide. So what's causing the increase? Is it natural? Is it anthropogenic, human caused? And can we even tell? Next slide. So I'm gonna save you a lot of um, agony on this, but we can talk about it in the Q&A if you want. We can fingerprint um, what's coming from human sources and what's coming from natural sources. Uh, we can use isotope ratio analyses, and um, I can go into that if you want at the end. Um, but really what we do is we use two main ways to try to see an, a source of this. One is the timing. When did we start to see an increase in greenhouse gas emissions? And then, of course, the isotope ratio analysis. Next slide. So let's see how this works. The purple line on this graph that is all CO2. We don't care where it comes from. It's just CO2 in the atmosphere. And uh, we record this in ice cores and we record it in um, observatories and all over the place. So um, if you just look at that um, purple line, you say, well, the CO2 levels have risen. 
Now, if we superimpose on this graph, only the CO2 that comes from human sources, that's the blue line. And you see that the only reason that we are warming is because the human CO2 levels are going up. Next slide. And just another way to look at this, the, the red line at the bottom um, is an approximation of what the pre-industrial CO2 levels were. Uh, they didn't fluctuate very much. They were pretty solid. Um, and the uh, line above that is all just uh, anthropogenic carbon dioxide. Next slide. And we can fingerprint nitrous oxides, methane, all kinds of different greenhouse gases, and we get the same result. They are the reason why we see increases in our atmosphere. Next slide. So we know the Earth's temperature is warming. It's, it's uh, unprecedented. It uh, is uh, due to an increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And those greenhouse gas, those increases in greenhouse gases are coming from human activities. Next slide. Okay, so now we kind of laid the foundation. And this is, you know, of course, there's so much more to talk about, but we need to move beyond this, right? And I'll be happy to come back to this if you want. But uh, let's talk about why this matters. What, so what? The Earth's uh, climate is changing. Well, this is bad news. It's very bad news. And uh, not just for the environment, but also for our economy and our, um, our social justice issues. Next slide. So there's a lot of uh, obviously examples of this. These are some of the things that we've worked on at Elma College from the last 20, 25 years. Uh, something to know, uh, first of all, that um, when we talk about vulnerable populations, we talk about lower socioeconomic status people, people of color, immigrants, these people uh, carry the biggest burden for environmental exposure, and we have all kinds of data on this. Um, the environmental uh, situation we find ourselves, I use Superfund sites um, only because Superfund sites are uh, considered sites that are pose an imminent threat to human health and the environment. There's 13, over 1,300 of these guys in uh, the country. There's 2,000 that are being investigated to be put as Superfund sites, and there's tens of thousands of sites that are being investigated that may eventually become Superfund sites. So we have created this environmental um, kind of risk zone in which we have uh, uh, put people in contact and uh, direct and indirect contact with a highly toxic material. And this has been going on for you know 150 years. Next slide. So just to hit this point home, I, I got a map for Wisconsin and everything in red is a super fun site. I think you guys have 36 of these. We have 64, 67. Um, and the red or the green uh, dots are Superfund sites that are remediated in quotes, I say, um, and will probably still pose uh, a threat to uh, uh, human health and environment forever. Uh, at the graph here, we see that uh, just to give some example, I know a lot of you already know all this. Um, minority representation is 39.6% of the total U.S. population. However, 50% of minorities are living within a mile. And for just to compare that, when we consider all um, of the white population, including those in poverty, um, we see that they are underrepresented rep relative to living near Superfund sites. Next slide. In particular, and this is pretty um, new stuff, there's a lot of people that are finding that uh, tribal communities are in particularly uniquely disproportionately impacted uh, by climate change and also by uh, living near um, in, uh, environmental hazardous materials. Um, let's look at the next slide. 
We have to be careful, though, how we talk about this, because um, if we stop at saying, well, you know, we're if you're, um, say, a, a, a native peoples that live in a, in a reservation and, well, the climate models don't show that uh, there's going to be a lot of, you know, extended heat waves or whatever. That's not the point. The point is, what is climate change doing to our um, environment? What's it doing to our culture? And so if you uh, can no longer fish or you can no longer hunt animals because they're gone or they're in low numbers because of climate events, then you are impacted. And that's what I'm really happy to say that a lot of sociologists are looking at right now. Next slide. Um, I threw this together because it's a really great case study that pulls everything that I've just been talking about into one concept. So let's let's go to the next slide and see what we got. Um, I don't know if you remember Hurricane Harvey 2017. It's one of the costliest and uh, uh, most devastating hurricanes ever. Um, next slide. So it was hit di right directly onto the city of, of Houston, which is always bad. Next slide. So let's look at, yeah, good. You can keep, you can just kind of go through that. I'll talk then. So one of the things that we know about Hurricane Harvey and why one reason we know it is a climate related hurricane is because when you warm the waters, the oceans like we have, and you've warmed the atmosphere uh, um, in an unusual way. So it's 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 got a higher temperature than average or for normal for that particular time of the year. You can get you get higher evaporation rates and you hold more water. Well, Hurricane Harvey did that in spades. It actually the the National Weather Service NOAA had to find another color for their maps because so much rain fell uh, when it stalled over. Uh, Houston. Next slide. So if you look at the top here in Baytown, five feet of rain fell between 36 and 48 hours. As far as we know, this is the highest rate of rainfall ever recorded in the world. So you can imagine the devastation. Next slide. And of course, winds uh, exceeding 130 miles an hour, uh, the spinoff of the tornadoes, uh, you know, very few uh, buildings are going to be able to withstand all of this, right? Especially low income housing. Next slide. So let's look at the environmental contamination and vulnerable populations. Next slide. All right, so just like every big city, um, every dot or every square here is a Superfund site, which is a little dismaying on its own. So imagine what would happen to these sites, uh, which have toxic materials associated with them when a hurricane comes through. Next slide. So basically, we just take all that, in, that, um, that material and we just dis disseminate it across the region. Now, if you look at this, you're like, well, you know, how is this uh, a vulnerable population? Why, how is this a, a minority population issue? Because doesn't everybody live around the Houston area? Well, go to the next slide. When we plot the highest level of devastation against the vulnerable populations, this is what we see. This is a little busy. So when we look at the, the dark blue and the teal, these are the most vulnerable populations. The um, yellow are the least um, vulnerable populations. And uh, the red are the highest impact zones. So when we actually run a statistical analysis on this and using GIS, we find that disproportionately by far, that the highest vulnerable populations suffered way more than the um, higher socioeconomic status. And part of that is because um, the people in the yellow, uh, they're at higher ground, they uh, uh, have uh, some uh, system in place, a lot of them do to avoid flooding, 
Uh, in fact, when they looked at the infrastructure of the city, the newest flood uh, um, emissions or controls were in these parts of the city. They were not in the most vulnerable parts of the city. And I know that's shocking, but um, there you have it. So next slide. Uh, so the other thing that we have to think about is the economic impacts and how that relates to vulnerable populations. So if you're a salaried um, you know, manager at a refinery that gets hit, um, you probably are okay for a few months while that, you know, things get set up to go. If you're an hourly employee, chances are, and you just lost your house, chances are pretty good you're not in the same boat. And that may be your source of um, quality health care, and that's gone. Next slide. And this is just, just an example of visual, give you an idea of the damage. Next slide. So one last thing on this is that we, we don't know, what a lot of people don't know is every single climate related um, event, like a hurricane or a flood has lingering economic repercussions years after the fact. And we still, we see this with Hurricane Harvey and we see it in other cases as well. Something else to think about, next slide. And then of course, there's the cost. Uh, there was an Economist arg article that said the direct cost um, for hurricanes since 1980 was about a trillion. Really, it's probably two to three trillion. And who pays for that? Because the, the federal government continually underfunds emergency management because of a lot of reasons. But um, during the Trump administration, it was purposefully underfunded because climate change was not in the cards. We don't need to address climate change. Next slide. Just another way to look at that. Next slide. So what else is there besides hurricanes? Next slide. Just to remind us that it's not just a hurricane. It's flooding. Kentucky last year had the worst flooding in states, the state's history. Next slide. And so did Texas. Texas has been hit repeatedly by floods, uh, despite the fact that the governor is an avid climate denier. Next. Um, wildfires. I don't know what it was like in uh, your neck of the woods this past summer, but we had people being hospitalized because of uh, air quality problems related to Canadian wildfires here in Michigan. Uh, so it was pretty bad. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to talk too much on this, but you need to know a little bit about this. Um, what we're finding and what we've been finding the last 10, 15 years is that um, when we have wildfires and when we have these climate related events, they actually uh, exacerbate climate change itself. So for example, permafrost uh, is, um, you know, vegetative material. It covers a very large part of the globe in the upper latitudes. And uh, when we start thawing it, it starts to decompose. When it starts to decompose, uh, greenhouse gases are produced. They go in the atmosphere. That accelerates warming. That accelerates melting. That accelerates decomposition, and so on and so on. Same thing we see with, with um, wildfires. So what we're doing is we're just creating these positive feedback cycles that are making the is part of the part of the reason why the trend is getting steeper, getting um, you know more egregious in in how fast our climate is is changing. Next slide. So how does this relate to this concept of the Anthropocene? And um, um, again, I'll save a lot of this for questions. Next slide. What we've uh, found is that we are actually in an extinction event and it's not good. So um, we measure extinction by species loss versus uh, species appearance, and we can calculate that. And we've been doing it for a long time. Next. So this is what we've kind of found. Most ecologists are 
at the point where we believe that it's a thousand to 10,000 times we are losing species at one to 10,000 times what we would normally lose at background rates. Um, we do have a lot of unknowns in this. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but um, it's part of some of what I've done with my colleagues. Uh, but here's what we know. Next slide. I think, yeah. So since 1970, 68% of all mammals, fish, birds, amphibians have gone extinct. Since 1980, 50% of all amphibians have gone extinct. And uh, by 2100, it's likely that 90% uh, of all ocean species will be at what we consider a critical tipping point or will be extinct. Um, so this is pretty amazing data here. And I keep thinking that it's not right, but we just had an ecologist from Columbia University come speak and uh, kind of said, this is maybe not is underreporting what he thinks is going on. Next slide. Um, in Germany, uh, they did a 26 year study and they saw a 75% reduction in insects. So this is problematic for a couple of reasons. One is 90% of all animals on earth are insects. And number two, they are the glue that keeps everything running. They are the workers. Um, they are the ones that uh, have these micro symbiotic relationships, some of many of which we have no idea about that we are just starting to um, discover that are put, you know, keeping everything on on uh, an even keel, and they're they're disappearing. Next slide. And um, of course, you've heard about coral bleaching, and the latest IPCC report says that um, if we don't change, if we keep on the current trajectory, it's very likely that they will be extinct, all of them, from the ocean, which would be an, an economic. Um, um, calamity. Next. So um, why are we getting extinction? Well, it's not just climate change. It's uh, habitat fragmentation and it's pollution. Plastic pollution is now coming to the surface to be one of the, the driving factors in why we think, um, you know, there's this exacerbating effect with all three of these things. Um, I will throw this in here in case someone has a question. PFAS, the, the uh, pair and polyfluoral alkyl chemicals that are the DuPont chemicals, um, we just have a paper published last year that showed the average concentration of these things in rainwater all over the world is higher than what is believed to be safe to consume in our drinking water. And think about how many people all over the world get their water from rainwater. We get our water from rainwater. And if we're not specifically taking these chemicals out, we're drinking this every day. Next slide. So lastly, what do we do? Well, we have to stop talking about climate change as a thing. It is, it's here, move forward. We have to start talking about adaptation. That is the key. You don't have to say the word climate change. You can say, boy, we've had a lot of bad weather and unusual weather, and it makes no sense for us not to plan for this so we can avoid a catastrophe next time we get a flood. That's just smart. It doesn't mean you have to believe climate change is real. It just means you have to be smart about and from an economic perspective. And the health, you can talk about it from a health perspective. You know, heat waves kill people. Heat waves kill more people than all uh, uh, climate-related climate, climate related, uh, weather events combined. So that is huge. Next slide. Um, I won't go too much in this unless we have um, some questions on it. There's a lot of people studying the planning phase of this. How do we get to that? And um, for to be politically active, just to look through these and get a sense of how we we make this work. When we go, when we start with preparedness or mitigation, um, that gets us a lot better response than if we start with waiting till something happens. And that's just common sense. Next slide. 
Um, I think I, this is the last slide. This I put this on. A lot of you maybe have seen this. Um, this was in Florida, and I can't remember which hurricane it was, um, but it was a pretty, you can see, pretty devastating hurricane. This building was the only building in a three-mile radius that was completely standing. And so they talked to the owner, and the owner was a contractor, actually. And they said, tell us why your, um, your house is still here. And he said, all I did was I took the blueprints and I increased everything by 20%. The concrete, the, um, the wood structure, everything, I just added 20% and that's what we get. I mean, talk about a simple solution. Next slide. And listen to the scientists. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, I know I really went through that and I, sorry because we, had a lot of time trying to get this up. Um, we only, what, we we have about 10 minutes for question and answer? Uh, yes, we do have 10 minutes um, for question and answer. And it looks like we have received a question in the chat. Uh, so I will just go ahead and read that. Uh, this cool. question is coming from Michael White. Uh, and he asks, with warming of northern latitudes, movement of trucks, we are now seeing worms in soil along roads into the northern areas of Canada. This will further free up CO2 trapped in ground cover. How much is this accelerating things? I'm familiar with the insect loss data, same thing documented in Puerto Rico. Okay, yeah. Um, so this is gets back to the positive feedback cycle, right? Um, two quick things about this. One, I don't know. I wish I could answer that question for you, but I suspect a good Google Scholar um, search would give you something. But we need to know that one of the weird things that we're finding is that this is occurring because um, the northern, uh, very northern and very southern latitudes are warming faster than every other part of the earth. And so when you get that, you're going to start these positive feedback cycles and um, whether this is significant enough to cause even further warming is something I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't, but it's a great point to be made. Thank you. Uh, and it looks like uh, we have a couple of questions from Andrea. And she's indicating that they're not as easily typed. So I'm going to ask her to unmute now so that she can ask those questions. OK, thank you, Sam. Um, so thank you for the presentation. That was very interesting. It's, of course, something I'm very concerned about um, on all levels, public health and, 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 and the impact economically and all those things. Um, and just in species, the, that species eradication was crazy. I didn't realize the numbers were so high. Um, I did have a couple of questions about numbers, just so you know, when I'm talking to people, I can make sure I get things right. So that the, you had a graph where you showed the non-human co contribution to uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, I believe, and then you superimposed the human contribution. So I'm wondering what happened to the non-human contribution. It's it's gone in the last part of the graph. So yeah, and you're a good catch. That was great. And I I realized what I did after I did it. Um, but you're right. So if you remember the graph where I had the red line at the bottom, um, that represented where the the non-human CO2 levels would be. They wouldn't be moving up or down. They would be, they'd be squiggly lines, but they would be essentially pretty level. Um, it would not be any net gain or loss. Uh, I didn't say that. And so the answer to your question is that's where the non-human CO2 would be. About 275 parts per million. We're now at 410 now parts per million. We definitely, in everything I've seen, will reach five to 600 parts per million. And that means we're gonna warm to a point where um, uh, we're already at a point, just so you know this, um, I took the slide out, 
we uh, can no longer fully adapt to climate change. We First of all, we can't stop it. We can't slow it. Even if we cut everything right now, there would be a lag time of many, many years uh, in which we would still see all of this happening because there's um, half-life time of these chemicals in the atmosphere. We're now at the point where we can no longer adapt to climate change. So um, we're, we know we're gonna be there, right? And, um, and that's what's so scary. If we were just looking at that one line that you're asking about, and, and you can find this online if you Google it, um, you can find these graphs as well. These are, and I usually reference these, but I, I was trying to, you know, pull graphs together and whatever. So this came from NOAA. Okay, thank you. The other thing, um, just to just to make sure I'm talking about the populations, right? So you had a you had a slide where you said fifty percent of minorities are within a mile of the Superfund site. And I think it was 70 to 75% of whites are within a mile of the Superfund. 72%. And that includes the poor, lower socioeconomic status. Sure. Sure. But it's the representation. Are, are white populations seeing the same representation of being next near these sites versus minority populations? And they are not. Uh, minority populations are overrepresented of living next to these sites compared to white populations. So, so that's what, percent of it. sorry. That, that's what the, I didn't think the numbers said that. So that's why I'm confused. So um, you said, so it, as a percentage of the whole population, are they, are they overrepresented? If 30 minorities are 39%, is it, a greater percentage of the whole population that's minority that's affected, or is it 50% of minorities, 70% of whites? So is it the poor in in general? So I'm yeah. trying to complete this with your yeah. graph of Houston. Yeah, where this the graph is confusing. And what I will do also is I will make this available to anybody. You can um, access this. Um, and there's other slides at the end of this if you want, and my contact information is there. It is, and we probably would spend too much time talking about this, but that's that you're asking the right question. We got to be careful how we talk about that. Um, is it like you said, the total representation, or is it the percent of that that group, whites, minority, whatever? Um, and if you go back to the slide, you'll see it should be clearer. I I think I wrote it out um, clear, so All I right. probably breezed through it. I apologize. Right. I mean, whether it's minorities or the poor who are being disproportionately affected, it's it's people who can't afford to be. So, um, so I certainly appreciate yeah. the gist. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so we do have a number uh, more questions. Uh, not sure that we'll be able to get to all of them in the next three minutes. But um, what I'd like to do, uh, I see that we have a question from Joe Nathan Kingfisher, uh, as well as uh, James O'Neill. So what I'd like to do is, those are somewhat similar questions. I'll just couple them together. Um, so Joe Nathan asks, tipping points, what do we face as a fundamental planet change? O ocean temp max out, other unexpected phenomenon. And James O'Neill asks, what tipping points do you think we have already passed? When do you think we will have mass extinction for most life on the planet? Good, great question. I'll answer it as quickly as I can. Um, let me give you a couple of tipping points. I just gave you a couple, you know, we can't stop it. We can't slow it. We can not even adapt to it. Um, the AR6 report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that um, if we don't take some pretty drastic action by mid-century, that we will face a global catastrophic environmental and economic collapse. That is in the report. Um, here's a couple other tipping points. One is in the 1950s, um, the uh, Scripps Oceanographic Institute found that the um, absorption of uh, CO2 by the ocean had saturated. So the ocean is a great absorber of CO2, but once you get to a saturation point, 
it no longer can take more. It still absorbs it, but it's only to a certain level. And that is where you started to see that very high, that hockey stick curve where we got a, a high uh, rate of change. Um, I think the next big one that I'm looking at, they're all, they're both related. So watch for these two tipping points. One is where is the CO2 level? If it gets up to 550 or 600, that's very, very bad. Um, the other is a two and a half degree warming since pre-industrial times, that's Celsius, and then a four degree. In my opinion, I don't think any climate scientist would, would really kill me for saying this. Um, I think we're easily at four degrees Celsius, and that unfortunately is pretty close to that cataclysmic um, endpoint. So... I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but those are very bad tipping points. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we do have one question left. Um, so I'll just pose that and see if um, there's a quick answer for it. Um, so we have a question from Rita. Um, with fracking being banned in Wisconsin, what is the biggest cause of warming? in Wisconsin? So I, I looked at this and actually it's um, multiple things. Habitat loss is really big. You don't, you guys are losing uh, the ability of nature to, to store and sequester carbon. That is super big. So I would, if you're talking about a political um, campaign, it should be on getting as many trees planted, as many wetlands restored, all of that. When you take those out of the system, you, that is devastating for global climate change. Um, there are others, but I think those were the big ones. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time um, and expertise today, Murray. Um, uh, with that, uh, that brings us to the end of um, this portion of the meeting. Um, so I, thanks again, Mar go ahead. Just saying my email is available and whoever wants to make that uh, available, if you didn't get a question answered, just send me an email and I will be happy to take some time and, and talk to you about it. So thank you. I appreciate what you people are doing. Good luck. Thanks, Joe Nathan. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Murray. Dr. Murray Borello, oh. great professor. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Murray Borello. Amazing. Thank you. All right. So next up on the agenda, we have Jonathan Kutab. Um, so I will go ahead and make them a co-host for this portion of the meeting and ask that they unmute. Um, and if you're ready, please go ahead. And it, see, I, I just wanted to um, to ask because uh, the, the question has come up, uh, Mr. Kutab, we want to make sure that we're pronouncing your name correctly. So if you could just, uh, introduce yourself very quickly and okay. thank you so much. <clears throat> That's fine. Uh, my name is Jonathan Kutab. I'm trying to see where I am. I can't find myself. Uh, uh we can see you. Yeah. Can you take out that, uh, Q and A? Ah, uh, that's better. That's yeah, better than I can that. see. <laughs> sorry. Okay. My name is Jonathan Kutab. I'm a Palestinian. I'm an international attorney. I am executive director of FOSNA, Friends of Sabil North America. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Al Haq, the uh, Palestinian human rights organization, uh, member of the bar in Israel, in Palestine, and in New York. Uh, and uh, I wanted to shift from uh, what you were talking about, uh, the ecocide to the ongoing genocide. Uh, but I think that there are some very, very clear uh, points of connection between the two. And let me explain. Uh, I I never expected uh that what is happening now in gaza uh 
would let me let me rephrase when the holocaust took place in germany th that took place largely in the dark uh, there were some people even in germany who pretended rightly or wrongly that they didn't even know uh, it was taking place and it was weeks and months after the liberation of the jews from the concentration camps that the horror of the genocide uh, took place uh, and uh, humanity i think uh, reacted correctly in trying to create more clarity with the conventions on the prevention of genocide uh, with uh, the creation of an international system however flawed because the superpowers didn't really want to be restrained or constrained so uh, the united nations system with its Security Council, uh, also included a veto power for the superpowers, uh, so that uh, in many ways, the international system was hobbled uh, to prevent it from being, from reacting uh, promptly and adequately to major human rights violations. Even though a criminal, international criminal court was created, uh, a number of mechanisms were put in place how then do we explain that a genocide would actually take place in real time on television screens and yet it would be allowed to take on and to occur continuously with very little uh, reaction? In fact, with those who are calling for a stop to it, just a ceasefire, just just pause for, for, for a second. Let's see what's happening. Uh, be uh, themselves accused, demonized, uh, and marginalized. How did that happen? And how can that happen particularly in, 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 in Western countries where supposedly there is a, a free press uh, and uh, a vibrant civil society uh, how how is it possible? What's been happening the last month or so has had me puzzled. Of course, we know, and I think the the current audience knows the the the, the almost fatal flaws of the democratic system, where uh, the two parties. Uh, are dominated by moneyed interests uh, to the point where uh, on, on really, really important issues like global warming, like the environment, like uh, the, the military industrial complex, and like this going genocide, there really isn't much choice and the corporate media certainly uh, speaks actually with one voice. It is amazing because uh, I follow uh, the Hebrew news uh, from Israel in real time, as well as Mayadeen and Al Jazeera in Arabic. And I get a totally different picture from what everybody in this country gets, even though I do try to vo watch both Fox News and MSNBC and CNN uh, and others. How did it, how is it then that this could happen? Well, part of the answer is the power of the narrative. A certain narrative was projected on October 7. Uh, a narrative that dismisses the context of what's been happening before, the apartheid system in Israel, the move towards the right wing, uh, the settlements, the siege of Gaza, uh, the stifling uh, siege of Gaza, all of that sort of gets sidelined. So we have no context. 
There is also a narrative about what happened on October 7th itself. Uh, downplaying or eliminating the nature of uh, the action by Hamas, which was primarily a military action, uh, breaking down the siege around them, attacking 22 military objectives, killing by Israeli sources over 300 soldiers, uh, taking over a uh, number of military outposts, including the command outpost of the Gaza Brigade, as well as attacking uh, civilian targets, which is illegal, of course, and taking civilian hostages, which again is illegal and a war crime under international law. I want to be very clear. But the narrative of what happened on uh, October 7 was that somehow this was an unprovoked attack of, of, of uh, immense barbarism and immense cruelty towards civilians, uh, taking of civilian hostages, again, which is, as I said, illegal, uh, but, but, but tremendous barbarism. Therefore, suddenly, the aim of the goal, the legitimate moral aim of the war, which was pursued, was the destruction, the elimination, the annihilation of Hamas. Uh, not only as a military force, but also as a political force and as an idea. And through it, this bleeds into the elimination or the attack on the entire Palestinian uh, people, the entire Palestinian population, at least in Gaza, if not in other parts of uh, Palestine. The genocidal language that was used uh, about Hamas needs to be eliminated and annihilated and totally destroyed uh, was combined with specific genocidal uh, actions that were declared. They are to be treated as, they are human animals and they have to be treated as such. And the same language that announced this dehumanization of, of Palestinians, and it wasn't only Hamas, because it says we will cut off their water, their electricity, their food, and we will order the entire population to move south as a first step. 1.2 million people are ordered to move south because Hamas is underground, and therefore we need to utterly destroy everything above ground. And then the lie is told that Hamas uses civilians as human shields. Therefore, their hospitals, their schools, their apartment blocks, their mosques, their churches are all legitimate target because Hamas is somehow hiding behind or among the civilian population. And we already say, Hamas needs to be destroyed. Therefore, destroying these targets becomes legitimate. There was an even openly declared abandonment of international law. We are taking off all the restraints because we need to eliminate this barbarous, absolute evil. And those who say, wait a minute, there's, there's, there's children that are being call, uh, killed. You need at least to allow water and 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 food and and uh, uh, medicine and uh, and then the, these people are told no 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 we cannot stop those who call for a ceasefire those who call for anything other than massive continuing uh, bombardment and destruction to be rained upon them somehow become themselves uh, evil or or collaborators with this evil. Rather than say that those who are silent, that those who allow, that those who deny uh, a ceasefire are the ones who are really complicit in this ongoing genocide. And when the numbers start piling up and you see 
over 11,000, now almost 12,000 uh, are killed, of whom 5,000 are children, by definition, civilians. Not to mention another uh, 3,000 who are women or elderly. Yeah, so that even assuming that the, the men uh, are, are, are uh, suspect of being uh, fighters or combatants, uh, clearly a, a, a massive amount of deaths, then uh, you start using the media, uh, you start questioning the numbers by saying that these figures are supplied by the Hamas-related Ministry of Health. So the question is not, are these figures correct or not? Or whether the health ministry has a good record of providing accurate information. Or the fact that the ministry actually lists the names, identity card numbers, age, and gender of those victims. Somehow, if you can add the adjective Hamas connected, Hamas related, Hamas touched, somehow that means that facts fly out of the window, reality flies out of the window, we are dealing with an absolute evil that needs to be utterly destroyed, and therefore the ongoing uh, killing must continue. And when we talk about the massive bombardment, the amount of the tonnage of high explosives that is rain upon a very tiny piece of land, which is about 22 miles long and between three and five miles uh, wide, uh, with, with, with 2.3 million people living there, half of whom are children, including 50,000 pregnant women in that population. Uh, somehow we can bomb them and bomb and bomb, and anybody who dares even use the word ceasefire becomes wrong. Well, they will use the word humanitarian pause. And we will sell the idea of a humanitarian pause because it will legitimize and justify us to continue with the bombing. Because it will enable us to move some of these civilians south and therefore presumably temporarily. But then we, of course, have to go after the south. Once we clean up the northern half of the Gaza Strip, we will need to clean up the southern half because that's where the evil Hamas is now located underground and they have to be pushed out, forcible civilian transfer, another war crime. And, and how can we do that? How can we perform these inhuman acts in, 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 in the sight of the whole world? Well, again, it's the power of the narrative. That is why from day one, Anybody and everybody who even talked about this, the first question is, do you condemn Hamas? Not do you condemn their actions against civilians. Do you condemn Hamas itself and what it did on October 7th? And if you fail to do that, then you yourself uh, cannot be listened to, uh, cannot be talked to. You are not part of the conversation. You, you are part of the evil that, that, that needs to be confronted. Now, I go into all these details for a very specific reason. Because on the climate issue also, there has been a narrative. And the narrative is, it didn't really exist. If it exists, it's part of a cyclical thing that happens over and over again. If there is any uh, warming or any weather changes, they are not human made. They are natural uh, part of the process. You know all this. You've been hearing that narrative again and again forever. And they will find one or two pseudoscientists here or there that would question the, the, the overwhelming, the overwhelming opinion and uh, 
decisions of climate scientists or of scientists generally or, or of truth speak speakers generally because the narrative itself allows enough confusion, enough uncertainty uh, that, that, that there is no truth. Uh, there, there are no facts. There is no science. Uh, there is only opinions and biases. And those who are in power have greater credibility to present their views and to prevent any action that would prohibit them from doing what they want to say. Well, I am saying all this not just as a Palestinian. Obviously, I have my own uh, interests and, and, and biases as a Palestinian. But I'm also saying this as a person who is biased in favor of international law and international institutions. As a person who has spent most of my time, when we set up uh, al haq the first Palestinian human rights organization, which Israelis now uh, uh, call a terrorist organization, together with a number of other uh, Palestinian civil society organizations. When we set up, we made a point of saying we want to be absolutely meticulous about our facts. We cannot afford to be caught in exaggerations or even in making truthful statements that cannot be fully documented in a credible fashion. That is convincing even to a not only neutral, but even to a hostile uh, public opinion. We had to start from below zero. We had to earn our right to be heard, to earn our credibility. And, and, and I would impress on our field researchers uh, that, 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 in fact, uh, our credibility is our most uh, valuable asset. We cannot afford to be caught in lies or in ag exaggerations or in uh, accusations of bias uh, against uh, our oppressors. Now, I am, I am really pained to find out that even when truth is pretty much clear, somehow it can be ignored. That, that, that our opponents can make outrageous lies with no basis in fact and no foundation and get away with it. Even though they consistently lie and are caught in their lies, they can get away with it. And if they have no evidence to present, they can get uh, somebody in the White House to say, I saw 40,000, uh, sorry, 40 beheaded children. When, when even the Israelis themselves aren't, uh, aren't making that claim anymore. I know that there's a command and control center underneath Al-Shifa Hospital, even though the Israelis go and capture the hospital and they can find no such command center. And when they present supposedly video evidence that is laughable on its face, when they present uh, posted uh, calendars in Arabic that we are supposed to believe are, are somehow a list of all the, quote, terrorists who guard these hostages, each signs their name uh, on, on that list. And, and anybody who speaks Arabic looks and says, what is this? This is not the names of terrorists or anybody else. This is the names of the days of the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There is no uh, evidence, but that is presented as evidence and you have to accept their statements because they are secret. There is secret evidence somewhere or intelligence somewhere, and you're supposed to take it as a fact that Hamas 
hides behind civilians and therefore if and when civilians are killed and we really don't really believe that those who are killed are civilians uh, that somehow uh, it's, it's Hamas's fault and, and they are guilty for it. So here we are over 30 days into an ongoing genocide that's taking place before our eyes and those who wanted to end, who wanted to stop, who want to think in terms of a political solution or in terms of some kind of negotiations, or at least in terms of following the rules the, of, of, of war. And this isn't a war, this is an onslaught. And what happened on October 7 was more like a jailbreak where people were trying to get out of a, a crippling, suffocating siege around them. And where they made the mistake of humiliating the military that was oppressing them. And now the military is coming back with massive firepower to show them who is a boss and to regain a supposed deterrence that I don't think they will ever regain. I, I, I will stop here because I realize that this subject, because, precisely because, uh, the position that I am uh, presenting is so contrary to the prevailing narrative uh, that, that I am open and willing to hear from any of you if you have any questions or if you want to challenge what I say as being inaccurate or untruthful, or if you have a different perspective th that you think needs to be uh, presented, uh, you are welcome to weigh in on it. Because ultimately, we do need the truth. And the truth should be the guiding principle that, 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 that uh, we should use in addressing this issue. Thank you very much for listening to me and for giving me this opportunity uh, to present uh, my views. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we have uh, Joe Nathan Kingfisher. Uh, we're just gonna move into the Q&A portion. Uh, so it looks like we have Joe Nathan Kingfisher on stack uh, with a question slash comment. So go ahead, Joe Nathan. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, this has been a very health uh, impacting uh, situation. Uh, I have stomach problems from watching the news. I mean, I, I it's like uh, a sci-fi horror movie in reality. And I mean, I remember there's this one movie called The Cube where everybody's trapped and dies. And then I look at the demolition of uh, a dense urban city and it's just it, it it's beside myself for an ability to articulate a response so jonathan thank you for uh, your perspective in this and you know one of the things that i i wonder about is when world war ii happened uh there certainly were lots of people that were fighting for democratic elections However, there's been this resurgence of fascism in the United States where people maybe, you know, look at look back at the, the World War Two and they say the United States won because the United States was the biggest fascist. And what was the Nazi Nuremberg defense? United States, look at yourself. Look what you did. You know, and it, it's like so the system's built on this land grab violent racist classist auction uh, you know the black robes are still running it here but just uh, would you comment particularly on the term settler because um we had a very high profile lawyer from the tribe here go to the east coast and present at the bloomberg foundation and she was quoted as talking about the native american indian community versus the settler population around and um you know that's a very important point because it is uh an ongoing social factor in the united states the settler relationship the land grabbing relationships and the tensions 
uh, in a in a border res town where the t land title matters. And by the way, they're still using the Catholic Catholic Church doctrine of discovery in legal cases to deny native land control here in the United States. So just could you please say a word about settler in the Israeli context? And thank yeah. you so much for all that. Yeah, the, the you know, Palestinians have often uh, said that the real way to understand what's happening is through the uh, prism of, of, of settler colonialism. Uh, that this was a group of largely European, but also from all over the world, who have come uh, to uh, a land the, the slogan of communism was a land without a people for a people without a land. Uh, that the Jews are an ethnic group that are being persecuted throughout the world, primarily in Western Europe, uh, who needed a country. A country with a specific ethno-religious identity for Jews. That serves Jews and helps Jews and provides for Jews. Uh, and somehow... Uh, you, you lose sight at all of the Palestinians living there. Uh, they either are non-existent, there's no such thing as a Palestinian people, it's an empty land, or to the extent that they exist, they really are a, a manufactured people. They're part of the Arab world. Let them go to the Arab world. They don't really have roots uh, in, in that land. Uh, we came in and made the desert blue. We came in and introduced Western society uh, and culture. We came in because we needed it, because we are a persecuted people. And 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 uh, I am I, I don't want to build my freedom on the suffering of others. But the settler uh, colonial framework that was created tries to deny or to delegitimize me, uh, just as they are doing with Palestinians in Gaza today. Two thirds of the population of Gaza are actually refugees who were made refugees in 1948 when the state of Israel was created and they were pushed out of their lands and they were denied the right to return to their lands. Uh, so uh, so the settler colonial uh, uh, framework is a very real uh, framework as far as I'm concerned. But even if one is not willing to go there, even if one is willing to say that the connection of the Jews to the land, the religious, historic connection, is a valid one that needs to be respected. How can you respect that without respecting the, the rights of the people who are living there? How can you respect that and somehow create a Jewish state for the Jews, of the Jews, by the Jews, as Jewish as France is French, without necessarily... Uh, discriminating against the original inhabitants who are non-Jews. So you claim you are uh, uh, the original because 2,000 years ago you had a kingdom there uh, and because you have a religious connection. Well, I tell everybody, you know, one year, once every year, Jews everywhere say next year in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is important to them. I agree. Jerusalem is important, but five times every day, Muslims all over the world look to Mecca and pray. That gives them no rights in Saudi Arabia or in Saudi Arabian oil wealth, just because they have a religious connection to the Kaaba and 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 uh, and, and uh, Islam, and and the historic rights are also uh, not sacrosanct because. There are many other countries. Jews had a, a country there for one century or 150 years. But so did the uh, Italians, Italy, <laughs> Greece, the Romans, uh, Syria, Iraq, Ethiopia, Persia, uh, Egypt. What country didn't have a kingdom in Palestine for three, four hundred years? Because we're right at, at, at the center of this place. So what I'm trying to say is this kind of claim that uh, Jews and Judaism has in Palestine cannot displace the people of the land who are currently living there. 
you cannot insist on a state that is racist and racialist that provides Jewish supremacy in Palestine over the rights of Palestinians. That is not legitimate. Uh, you can say we, we want to live there together with Palestinians on the basis of equality and mutual respect. Yeah, maybe there is something there to talk about. A, a democratic state for both Arabs and Jews in the land. But you cannot just come and say, this is our land. God gave it to us. Lord Belfour gave it to us. We won it by, by power and by force. Or the Western world gives it to us. You see, I'm not so worried about the fascists as I am about the liberals. The decent people who try to justify what really is fascism and what really is discrimination and racism uh, against Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying all that. Yes, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have a question from Sean Kane in the chat. Sean asks, what are the unions and leftist parties in and around Israel doing? What is their status today? Well, again, it depends on your narrative. If your Zionist narrative requires a Jewish state, then whether you, you're a unionist, your union tries to be for Jewish workers and for Jewish rights. And if you are a leftist, but but your, your, your socialism and your leftist ideals uh, are infused with Zionism for Jews, then, then uh, all your humanitarian progressive ideas are there to serve Jews only and, and, and Arabs get lost in, in the process. But if you believe in equality between Arabs and Jews, then, then you are living a contradiction. Because you have to acknowledge the right of the Arabs to equality. You have to acknowledge that Arabs have the right of return, including all these refugees whose land you're living on. Then you have to deal with Palestinian Arab nationalism on an equality at best with Jewish aspirations. In this case, uh, under Zionism, wanting to have Jewishness recognized uh, on the base of equality, then you have to really believe in a democratic society. And your democracy has to be for Jews and non-Jews. And, and many of them stop short of that. They say, yes, we believe in equality, but not the right of return for Palestinians. Yes, we believe in equality, but Palestinians shouldn't be allowed to become a majority. This has to continue to be a Jewish uh, majority state. Yes, we believe in equality, but we want special status for Jews over non-Jews. Uh, and, and you find this a lot among uh, American progressive. Uh, there, there was called PEPs, progressive except for Palestine. Progressive, I am against nuclear weapons, but Israel needs them. I am against militarism and too much power to the military, but Israel needs to be militaristic to defend itself. Progressive, yes, I am for equality for everybody, but Jews have to have special status and should be allowed to have privileges over non-Jews in Palestine because they need it, because of persecution in the West, because of whatever reason you, you provide, somehow your progressiveness stops when it comes to Palestinians and Israel. And this is what was happening even before October 7th. Many Jewish progressives in this and other progressives in this country were feeling totally uncomfortable because Israel was being blatantly fascist, blatantly right-wing, 
blatantly racist and 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 and, and good jewish people in this country are feeling totally uncomfortable with 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 with, with israel and its policies when october 7th came you forget about everything in the in the past you forget about the nature of israel that was being openly declared by its leaders and you say oh hamas is barbaric they are a terrorist they kill civilians they take civilians as hostages it must be destroyed whatever it takes to destroy hamas and basically palestinian uh, nationalism needs to be done uh, that's the right thing to do so yes i think uh leftists and unionists and progressives have a problem when it comes to Israel. They are not willing to apply the same standard across the border. Thank you. Thank you for saying how it is. It's a tough message because the entire atmosphere has, has a different narrative. And if you give that message, you are being silenced. You are told you are anti-Semitic. Uh, but you, your rejection of Zionism, your rejection of Israeli policy is said, oh, you're rejecting the only Jewish state around. You're being anti-Semitic. And, and, and I wanted to make it clear, if, if I didn't make it clear before, I'll make it clear now. Anti-Semitism, that is anti-Jewishness, because we are Semites too. <laughs> Anti-Jewishness is a very evil force that needs to be stopped wherever it shows its ugly head. I, if, 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 if you hate, don't like Jews, if you hate Jews, I'm not looking to you to be my ally. I don't need you to be my ally. Because if you hate Jews, you probably also hate Muslims. And you probably hate Catholics. And you probably hate <laughs> a number of other people. So I, I, I don't need you. Thank you very much. I will fight you. Uh, you are my enemy. You are not my friend if you don't like Jewish people. Uh, in fact, I, I, I praise, I thank God every day for JVP and if not now and the other Jews who sometimes have to fight with their own family and with their own tribe in order to take a principled position on, on Israel-Palestine. So this is not about you know, hating Jews, to the contrary. I, I totally reject that position. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so it looks like we have a few minutes left. Um, uh, it looked like maybe Dave had a question that he had asked in the chat earlier. I just want to make sure I get it right. Oh yeah, sure. I can, I can raise that. Um, and I, th I think, uh, Jonathan, you mentioned at one, what you said was that the slogan of communism was a people, uh, land without people for a people without land. But, uh, my question was just, uh, did you mean to say Zionism? Zionism. I didn't say communism. Sorry. That's the Zionist, uh, goal or, or slogan. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, if this, if I only have a couple of minutes, I might as well uh, put in a commercial. <laughs> uh, if if you like uh, my my position, we have an organization called FOSNA, Friends of Sabiel North America. Uh, you can go on fosna.org. Uh, if you want to join uh, our mailing list, we try to send only one thing a week. And I usually have some, I hope, interesting things to say. Uh, there's also a book I wrote called Beyond the Two-State Solution, which you can download for free uh, from nonviolenceinternational.net. It's available in Arabic, English, and Hebrew, and you can download it for free. It, it presents a, uh, a vision for a single state for both Jews and Arabs. 
uh, instead of giving a thorough critique of uh, Zionism, which I sort of did today, uh, this says, okay, regardless of whether it's good or bad, here's the current situation, and here's how Jews and Arabs can live together in a single state that provides for both sides uh, without pretending that there's any symmetry or equality between the two. It is possible for them to live together in a society that addresses their needs. Uh, you can either get it, uh, I don't like Amazon, but free, you can get it from Amazon, you pay for it, or you can get it for free to download uh, from this uh, Uh, fr from this site. I also have another book uh, called The Truth Shall Set You Free, uh, which is also available in audiobooks. Thank you. Uh, so it looks like we're at 145, which is the... Um, time that we had scheduled to take a break. Um, so I just want to thank Jonathan for your presentation. Uh, I don't find anything to disagree with. So I really appreciate you coming here at, and speaking to us. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan. We really appreciate your time and you know, I think I speak for all of us when, you know, we are just horrified and outraged at what is happening to the Palestinian people. And, um, you know, we want to support you in any way that we can. So, so who thanks. are you running in Pennsylvania where I can vote? Oh, we'll be in Pennsylvania. Yep. The Green Party is national. The Green Party okay. is global, in fact. And um, and most Greens around the world have been very much on the right side of this. Not all of them, to be honest, but uh, but you know many many of them, most of them, and certainly in the U in the U.S., the Green Party is the largest uh, party in the country that is truly anti-war and anti-genocide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Wow, okay. So those were two dynamite presentations. At this point, we have our break. Um, and so folks, you know, please uh, feel free to step away at any point and we will reconvene at 155. Uh, to begin the business portion of the meeting. Thanks. Thanks for being green, everybody.
All right. It's now 1.55, so folks can uh, start returning to the meeting. Um, yeah, because we have a business portion of the meeting scheduled to start at 1.55, and we want to make sure that um, you know, we're able to get through our agenda and um, you know, respect everyone's time. Um, so, okay. All right, so we have, um, I'm just gonna share a few links for folks because I know uh, we have some new members and it's always good to have a reminder. So we have our bylaws. As well as our code of conduct. I'll share that. And then um, the agenda for today. Folks can see what's on the agenda. Okay. Um, all right, so as folks can see um, the two items that we have on our business agenda for today our discussion of proposed bylaws changes and officer elections. Um, so how things are going to go is that, uh, you know, first there will be a uh, presentation of the proposed bylaws changes. Um, and we have two of those. Uh, one was previously discussed at the spring gathering, um, sent out in the spring and fall newsletters. And another is a, uh, a new proposal that was just recently um, proposed and that was sent out in the fall gathering uh, or the fall newsletter. So we'll present those and then folks will have a chance to um, discuss the bylaws proposals. Um, you know, as mentioned earlier, we, um, you know, because of the number of people in the meeting and the time that we have, uh, we're asking folks to limit comments to three minutes or less, preferably less, and we'll have a timer for that. Um, and hopefully we'll have enough time to discuss these items. But if not, the good news is that we have a discussion email list that is open to all dues paying members in good standing, where we can continue the discussion about these issues uh, beyond the meeting. And uh, then, you know, uh, the electronic ballots will go out to all dues paying members in good standing uh, so that the will of the membership can be heard. Um, for officer elections, we'll have candidates, uh, you know, we have some candidates who've already self nominated. We're also still accepting self nominations. Um, and once those self nominations have been made, then candidates will be given, uh, you know, again, a, um, three minutes or less to make a, you know, a brief speech. Um, and then we will uh, go around and any member in good standing, you know, who wishes to uh, speak to uh, the elections issue uh, will have, you know, their time. And so the way that we're going to do it is at first the candidates will all get chance to make their speeches and then every member will get the chance to speak um but again given the number of people um you know we may not have time for uh you know very extensive discussion where people are you know speaking multiple times about the same issue um you know we don't want to get into back and forth debates or anything like that now again we have the email discussion list 
uh, which is going to facilitate you know, any ongoing discussion. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically, um, the long and short of it. Again, if you would like to get on the stack to discuss the issues at hand, then please put the word stack into the chat. Um, and that way, um, the facilitators can see, uh, you know, basically the order that people got on stack and um, you know, calling them in that order. And uh, yeah, you know, we'll also prioritize people who have not spoken yet. Um, and yeah, I, so I think that basically, um, you know, covers the uh, you know, the the agenda for the business portion. So why don't I hand it over to Sam for the uh, introduction of the proposed bylaws changes? Sure thing. Thanks, Dave. So, one moment while I get these pulled up. Just bear with me for one moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the full language of the bylaw uh, change proposals um, was sent out in the uh, in the newsletter. Uh, so what I'll do now is just do a quick screen share. I'm not going to read through the full text of the proposal uh, because. Uh, we're we're trying to be mindful of time. So one moment. Okay. Great. All right. So the uh, first bylaw proposal that we have on the agenda is a set of changes to the bylaws, which in effect move decision-making, um, change the decision, uh, change the bylaw language to align with, um, you know, existing procedures of, uh, of, you know, calling for full membership vote online uh, for elections and uh, major decision-making. So there are a number of places in the bylaws where decision-making procedures are outlined and the bylaw um, amendment proposal in effect um, alters the language of those to move those to an online vote uh, for the purpose of allowing greater input from the membership. Um, all those in the party who are in good standing as opposed to just um, individuals who are able to attend a particular meeting. The second bylaw proposal that we have up for vote is a change um, in the wording of section eight, which currently indicates that, <sighs> that, um, local chapters uh, and caucuses do a um, election at their meeting, but then the actual vote occurs in tandem with the membership meetings. Uh, so we received this uh, amendment proposal from the Grand Walker Green Party. And in effect, what it does is that it um, allows local chapters and caucuses to um to appoint their replacements uh between membership meetings uh so those are our two bylaw um related proposals 
So with that, let me just take a glance at the chat and start calling stack. Looks like we have um, Rita on stack. So I will ask Rita to unmute quickly. Okay, and as um, as stated earlier in the meeting, um, be mindful of time um, since we do have a number of people here. So Rita should be receiving a request to on, oh, I see. So um, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Um, first of all, um, we cannot vote at this meeting to change the bylaws uh, because our bylaws say that we need to vote at the meeting. So even if we um, if, if we vote outside of the meeting, it doesn't take effect for this meeting. So uh, uh, one of the problems right here is that we have not been able to speak. And um, according to the bylaws, the coordinating council is supposed to be um, following the will of the membership. So. I would ask that we be allowed, first of all, to amend the agenda and allow Mary um, to say what she wanted to say for the agenda, as long as I'm on mic, because I'm muted and I, I can't, I'm not allowed to say anything. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for that um, and ask that the membership be able to vote on that, that we be able to amend the agenda to add a certain issue um, to the agenda. And about the bylaws, um, the problem with the, the online voting is that it doesn't take into consideration our consensus model. We cannot have, con we can't reach by consensus if everything is always voting online. Plus, people who are not at the meeting do not hear the discussions, so they're not very um, uh, necessarily uh, understanding what is at stake. So I would say that, um, first of all, I would ask that each of those changes in the bylaws be considered separately because there are a lot of changes from this one proposal and that um, we be allowed to vote at the meeting. We have to be able to vote at this meeting right now because uh, that's our bylaws. We need to follow our bylaws and our bylaws don't say online voting. Our bylaws just say ranked choice voting and we can do that in person. That's it. And so you were requesting that Mary be allowed to speak. Is that what I um, had heard? Yes, yeah, so she had at the very beginning of the meeting. She had asked to be heard and asked. To okay, thanks, again. Rita. I'll let I'll let Mary speak now. Go ahead, Mary. Mary, you should have received a request on mute. There you go. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that, Mary. I was trying to send you another request on mute, and I inadvertently muted you again.
Okay, go ahead, Mary. All right, thank you. You can hear me now. Yes. I move to add at the beginning of the agenda, 15 minutes to hear non-officers thoughts about losing James Bankard, Barb Dahlgren and Tom Rodman's leadership. This deserves the attention of the wider membership here today for many reasons. First, it's a big deal in the history of our state party. This is the first time members may be stripped of their duties and removed and, and divisive action. Article 3, section 2 of our bylaws states, the coordinating council is charged with implementing the will of the membership as decided at membership meetings. And here we are. Today is the first chance for the membership to discuss and decide whether this process has been fair and wise for the party and whether it truly represents the Wisconsin Green Party. The second reason I am moving for open discussion is that this whole procedure was handled by fewer than half a dozen individuals who accused, then judged, and decided on punishment without oversight. I feel we, the larger membership, need to provide oversight to protect the party and advance the greening of Wisconsin next year. Thank you. That's my motion. I don't know that I can. Is there a second? Yes, I see there is a second in the chat all right okay um, so let's let's do a um let's do a quick straw poll of the members uh presence um so if if people want to add to the agenda uh, discussion on the uh the removal of barb dahlgren and tom rodman from the party as well as the removal of James Bankard from the membership committee. Um, people would like to add this to the agenda, then put yes in the chat. If you would not like to add it to the agenda, please put no in the chat. So I'll also um, raise the point that Mary, uh, we did receive your um, your email, and um, you know, partially in response to that, we uh, you know we did include in the newsletter um, information about you know why uh, Barbara and Tom were removed. Uh, so if, if folks are, you know, as well as you know, and there's also been information about the uh, removal yeah. from officer positions of Barbara, Tom, and James Bankard. Um, so if folks were unaware, you know, that information has been made available. It's all information from the officers. I'm wishing to hear what the other members think. Okay, so now let's, let's take a look um, at the straw poll, okay. Trying to get a count. Do you need a majority to open a discussion? Yes. Our bylaws <laughs> state that you need 60% uh, to approve any decision and and particularly because this is being raised from the floor without any attempt to provide advance notice to the coordinating council or the membership. Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of, 
an extraordinary you procedure, today. but yeah, we do need 60% approval to proceed, you know, with any uh, emergency addition to the agenda. Excuse me, Dave, you did just say that you got my email proposing this amendment. Um, Thank you. We did receive an, yeah, we, you know, we got an email. And like I said, you know, then provided information. I believe this is a new proposal entirely, but um, anyway, um, let me look for that right now. Sam, do you have accounts? Yeah, I just want to make sure I got everybody. Okay, so for yes, we appear to have 15. Uh, and that includes um, an individual with the name Leafly. Um, so if they could just confirm who they are, be helpful. Uh, and then we have 22 votes uh, for no. Okay, Mary, I found your email and here's what you wrote to me. I'm requesting 15 minutes at the beginning of the fall gathering for CC to inform us all why we lost Barbara D and Tom R as officers, fellow members. So again, you know, we, we put in the newsletter exactly what you requested. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Correct. Correct. I, I stand corrected that I I, sh I should have asked then for a non-officer discussion. Forgive me. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's continue with our agenda. And again, we do have a discussion email list where uh, you know folks can inform themselves and others and discuss these issues. But yeah, again, we have a, an agenda that went through our democratic process that we notified members of with the requisite advance notice. So let's continue with that. Okay, so are there any, any other, um, does anyone else wish to speak to the, uh, the bylaws proposals at hand? Looks like we have Emerson on stack. One second, and I will get you muted. Um, hi, I just want to make sure y'all can hear me. Um, but I wanted to speak in favor of allowing online voting. Um, I am under the impression and belief that having in-person voting only creates a number of biases in a voting system. Um, specifically, one, it creates a biases towards older members. People who are retired tend to have more free time than people who are working full time. Additionally, it creates a class bias, again, in that same vein, as well as um, a bias against folks who have um, unstable work conditions or work weekends. Um, I I have wanted to be involved in the Green Party meetings for a long time and have consistently not been able to in the past because I was working weekends at the time they were happening. And I will cede my time. Thank you, Emerson. Uh, looks like next on stack we have Bruce. So let me get Bruce unmuted. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, Bruce. Uh, those audio issues are um, causing significant um, 
problems for the audio. Okay, well, um, while Bruce and company work on that audio issue, um, are there any other folks that would like to comment on the uh, first bylaw change proposal? Go ahead, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, um, I want to, uh, you know, heartily second all of Emerson's comments and point out that uh, we have been uh, voting like this in practice for years now, and it's worked very well. Um, it's allowed all members to participate in important decision making even when they're unable to make it to a specific meeting at a specific time um, or even in a specific place, uh, you know, which is less of an issue with virtual meetings, but there, there are accessibility issues with, with any meeting. I think Emerson spoke to that really well. And, you know, for example, um, you know, some of our longtime members um, were, wanting to make it today, but we're simply unable to because of other conflicts. Um, you know, for example, Rebecca Kemble, who is a longtime Green elected official and, uh, you know, a very well-respected leader uh, in Madison and nationally. And uh, she had another commitment um, and that happens to all of us sometimes. Doesn't mean that we should be excluded from decision-making. You know, particularly folks who uh, have unusual work hours, have uh, child care responsibilities. Um, there are, you know, the I could go on and on, but I, I think we all understand that this is a fundamental issue of fairness and democracy. Um, so I absolutely support bylaws proposal one. And again, it's, it's just formalizing what we've been doing in practice uh, for years uh, very successfully. And you know, I'd also point out that we have, uh, you know, just since the spring gathering, we've increased our dues paying membership by nearly 50%. And I think that that growth trend is going to uh, keep continuing. And um, yeah, and I think that this is just the absolutely the fairest and most democratic way to ensure that everyone's voice is heard. It's passed. Okay, and I see that um, that uh, the audio issue for Bruce has been resolved. So let me just send the request to unmute again. Okay. Any feedback? Nope. All right. Well, I, uh, we discussed these amendments last spring. I moved to table them to the fall meeting. And that was noted in the minutes for last spring. What was not noted was my part of my proposal that said we needed to be able to discuss these issues as a membership. And the coordinating council said they would set that up. They claimed to have set that up in the last spring's minutes, but there's nothing in um, any of the notices on our website that that happened. I don't remember seeing, receiving anything from 
the party on how to do that. I did notice that uh, you put in a link at the bottom of today's agenda about the decision-making list. But I really don't think you applied uh, or complied with my motion, which was not only to table the, the uh, uh, amendments, but to set up a system where we can easily communicate and, and discuss all these amendments and all the other issues that the membership should be able to discuss. And for that reason, I move that we table those motions on these amendments until the spring meeting. And we know for sure that people are able to discuss these things online because there's a lot of ramifications that could come from, from these two amendments and uh, they need to be discussed. We, 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 we get so little time at these membership meetings to even discuss this stuff. And I think just way too many amendments have been rammed through uh, the, the membership meetings in the past simply because there's no time to discuss it amongst a wide group of people. And it's just not democratic. And the bylaws also say that uh, we, everything in the Green Party will be done in accordance with the U.S. Constitution, which means freedom of speech. Pass. Anybody want to second the motion? Looks like Curtis Bolton seconded the motion. Uh, so I think that we should um, do as last time. Uh, with individuals um, putting their vote into the meeting chat. Okay, if you haven't voted yet, please get your vote in quickly. I'm about to pull the responses. So to be clear, the the proposal was to table um, this the bylaws proposals until the spring 2024 gathering. This is not a vote on whether to discuss it to discuss these issues more. Uh, we do have time a lot at the meeting to discuss the bylaws proposals, although some people are taking that time to propose new motions from the floor. But to be clear, we do have time allotted to for discussion. We also have an email list where people can continue to discuss. Okay, it seems we have five yes votes. Uh, like one more came in, so six yes votes. Yeah, I think maybe and nine. 20. Nine? Did I? Well, there's one. Josh uh, has three people in the household. So I count nine yes and 17 no, roughly. Clearly the motion uh, does not pass. Um, so we can continue the discussion of the bylaws proposals. If anyone has, um, you know, anything more to say.
Okay, so would anyone like to get on stack to discuss the bylaws proposals? So to be clear, uh, we're, we're not planning to vote on the actual bylaws proposals or elections at this meeting. And I'm sorry if this wasn't addressed before. Um, as has been our practice for years now, we would like to use this meeting for discussion of these decision items. And then the actual decisions will be made by electronic ballot sent to all members in good standing. Um, so is that clear? Does anyone have any questions about that? Again, there are many members who are unable to make it to this specific meeting. So this is the practice that we have. Yeah, this is the practice that we have uh, followed for voting for years, but the bylaws proposal one is to formalize that. Question is, so we're voting on whether to vote online, online. The answer is yes. Does anyone else have any questions or discussion about the bylaws proposals? Okay. Um, <clears throat> looks like Curtis would like to speak. Um, is Curtis in here or uh, Rita? Can you give me some guidance on which of your um, logins to unmute to allow Curtis to speak? Um, yeah. I'm seeing Kurt in here. Is 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 Kurt with you? Um, in in person. Oh, I see. Okay, um, my name's Kurt Bolton. Um, I used to be recording secretary on the coordinating council. Am I, am I coming through? Sounds like it. Yes. Um, I think if the Green Party wants to move forward, they have to move forward as a truly democratic party from the bottom up, not the top down. We already have two political parties like that. So I think the coordinating council having the ability to unilaterally remove people from membership is not a good idea. If they want to remove somebody from their officer duties, well, that's their, they can do that. But I don't think the coordinating council is the Green Party. I think the members of the Green Party is the Green Party, and we should have final say on that. So I don't recommend approving uh, proposal number one. Uh, proposal number two does allow for removal of members by the coordinating council, but does say that the, the membership as a whole should have a chance to vote on that decision as well, because 
this is the Green Party where the people are, are the power in the party. And I, I find myself agreeing with that. So it's sort of a middle ground where, yeah, if the coordinating council wants to do it, we can still leave that option with them. But final resolution is up to the uh, membership and they should have a say in that, not just a few people, you know, at, at the top of the coordinating council. Thank you. Did you say the question is signed? Did you not Thank you. Um, are there any further comments um, which relate to the bylaw change proposal? Otherwise, I would suggest that we move to the next agenda item since we are slightly behind schedule at this point, which would be the officer election. So I'll just um, give one one more chance for folks to Make a co make comment on the bylaw change proposals. Otherwise, um, I would suggest that we move the agenda forward. Okay, it looks like we have Bruce on stack again. Bruce, uh, please try to keep um, your comment brief uh, since you've already spoken on the topic um, and we are running behind schedule. I sent you the request to unmute. Okay, it's the Second Amendment proposal. I strongly disagree with allowing only the coordinating council to write to uh, remove members. We are a membership organization. The membership um, supersedes coordinating council. Coordinating council is designed to serve the membership and not vice versa. If we take away the membership's right to approve or disapprove of removals. We're making this organization far less democratic and much less of a membership organization. Courting councils take over, basically. And um, I'm watching the membership slowly fading into second or third or fourth place in terms of whose wishes this party runs by. So this amendment has to be defeated. Pass. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I'll respond quickly that these bylaw changes um, do not take powers away from the membership. They uh, change the input mechanism uh, from the membership meeting to the online vote. Uh, these uh, bylaw proposals don't grant the coordinating council any additional powers. Oh. Um, okay, I see uh, Joe Nathan is is on stack. Um, so go ahead, Joe Nathan, and yeah, just um, friendly request to be mindful of time. So the question is, uh, who audits these? And um, the records are there and readily available to proper membership, right, Sam? Right, yeah. We do uh, take records of all of the elections, um, as we did um, last year. We also um, have the ability to bring in independent election monitors, uh, which was the case 
last year. We actually have one of those um, election monitors in attendance today, Holly Hart, who is the uh, secretary of the National Party. Um, and uh, based upon our tabulation of the previous election, um, we received um, commendation from the uh, election monitors. Did you did you have uh, additional? Oh, comment? just um, a quick comment. Um, yeah, it's great that there's um, more people involved at this gathering. This is great. And maybe there's just a critical mass factor that uh, kicks in a little bit more democracy, because when you only have a dozen people, uh, the personality factor becomes quite a bit more edgy to deal with. With more people, there is more democracy. And I think the membership uh, does you know, naturally produce uh, some more resilient, uh, uh, you know, uh, synergy together. So, um, right, I, I um, can attest to the difficulty that it has been uh, in just dealing with uh, a, a limited number of people willing to be involved with the leadership. And I encourage everybody, anybody, please get involved with the committees. And, um, you know, uh, the pillars and the principles are there to be interpreted. And um, yes, it, it, the communications are there. Uh, respectfully, uh, th this presents a very good mechanism for dealing with uh, difficulties. And I, I do support uh, these uh, bylaw changes uh, from the inside. And I just, uh, I respect that uh, the membership has grown. And uh, it's it's so wonderful and fulfilling as a Green Party member to uh, have more members. Thank you. Please be involved more, everybody. Thank you, Joe Nathan. Okay. Um, so Bruce is self-nominating for recording secretary. And fifth district. At large. Um, all right, I'm going to share the self nominations, which I have uh, collected in the chat and from our self nomination page. Um, if you find that you are missing or one of your nominations is missing, please let me know. Josh at large. Tiffany for at large. Emerson. A freeze for CD six. Okay. I had thought I had seen a a nomination from Bobby Gifford, but I was struggling to find that in the chat. Can anybody um, confirm or deny that? Um, 
Uh, do we know what what it, it was for a seed? Okay, he's running against you, Michael. Thanks. Three. Thank you. Looks like we have Bruce um, both nominating for National Committee. For corresponding there are four open positions on the national committee. Okay, looks like Bobby is withdrawn from the CD three race. CC at large, the date as well. Okay. Okay, and looks like we have. Michael self nominating for national committee. Okay. So we do um clearly have a substantial um number of candidates. Uh, so I would like to offer, uh, folks, okay, Barbara Eisenberg for District 4. Okay. So what I would like to do, I would like to offer, um, folks the opportunity to um to speak um who have been nominated and also members to um ask questions uh due to the uh number of folks that we have um what i'd like to do is to um with the first rate uh how should we do this um I'd like to uh, offer everybody some time to speak. Um, if you're running for multiple positions, uh, I would just like to ask that you um, discuss those positions, um, all, all three positions in your statement. Um, and then we will have a... Um, brief question period after that if folks have any questions okay folks are continuing to self-nominate um so looks like the first person we have on the list is aj reed uh, AJ, would you like to make a comment? Okay, I've sent you the request to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'll, I will try to make this brief. Um... I really do appreciate um, the nomination for a co-chair for our state party. And I think, you know, those who have like known me uh, over the years um, in the Green Party um, have seen the kind of things I have done, not just in my involvement 
in like local, state, national, as well as international levels of the party. But I also like have these con- have conversations with people on like where they're at and having very difficult conversations with people um, through tenuous times. And it's and I'm not just talking about you know things are going on at this moment, but in places and other states and then working with other state parties and facilitating their difficult times because the people who have reached out to me have always mentioned that they like to have me there because at least I have an understanding of what's going on as well as trying to have these conversations with folks and trying to get to where we can meet at I, either on common ground issues or the things that we need to be working on and everything. And I think if we do need to build a green party um, at the state level, um, we do need to have serious conversations for sure, as well as, you know, planning for strategic things. So with that said, um, I feel um, as a candidate for the co-chair of the green party, it would be a, an honor for those to uh, have me uh, represent the state party as co-chair. Thank you, AJ. Uh, next, we have Rita Maniotis. Rita, would you like to make a comment? I'll send the request on you just in case. Tell him where you are. You gotta I am, I'm already right. there. All right. Hello, hello. Let me turn the camera toward me so people can see who, I, who the heck I am. Except it's, it's not really bright. Um, sorry for the lighting. Hi, I'm Rita Maniotis, and I have been active green since 2006. Um, I moved to Wisconsin uh, this summer. And I have um, been active even in Wisconsin. This is actually the third membership meeting I have joined you with. Um, I came up and, and gathered signatures for Cheryl, um, Cheryl McFarland and also for Bruce, uh, for, yeah, Bruce uh, Hawkins, Howie Hawkins, Howie Hawkins. Um, because I, I came up several times to do that when he was running and uh, during those difficult times and it was hard to get signatures. But anyway, I've been active since 2006. I have run for office in Illinois uh, for state rep for school board. I've been kicked off the ballot for school board and the, the Cicero um, school district where they actually went door to door and threatened people that had signed my petition and I had to go to court to, to um, they, the school district actually spent $7,000 to throw me off the ballot because they don't want to have anybody um, finding out what's going on behind closed doors there. So I have some experience in politics and the rough and tumble of politics. But um, anyway, I served as a secretary of the Illinois Green Party and assistant treasurer and did all the treasury work because the person didn't know how to, that was the treasurer, didn't know how to use a computer. So we retrained him and uh, I was on the national committee. Um, I have been active with the West Side Greens. Um, uh, I have served as committeeman for the Berwyn Township District uh, for eight years and got questions on the ballot that way. And I also um, uh, not only served as Berwyn Township committeeman, oh, I was Cook County Chair. And in that, I my goal was to have representation from all of the townships in Cook County. And I got halfway there because there's 30 townships. So we got 15 representatives there to try to build the Green Party structure. And I'm interested in helping Wisconsin grow the party. Um, I have a lot of expertise in what elections law looks like, um, what elections treasury law looks like in, in uh, filing for the FEC and doing all those kinds of things. So I have a lot of experience and I think I could be helpful to Wisconsin, help grow the party here. So I'm hoping that you will vote for me. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. Uh, 
next we have Melissa Minkoff. Hello, everyone. I'd like to announce my nomination. I'll be really brief. I'm uh, running for operations treasurer as well as District 2. I've been the uh, CC rep for District 2 for two years now. I would like to continue serving in that role. However, um, with the resignation of our operations treasurer or the ending of his term rather, um, we that position is vacant. So I'm running for uh, that the positions of operations treasurer. I possess about a decade of experience um, in treasure, fulfilling treasurer type duties for a variety of membership based uh, organizations in Wisconsin. Um, so I feel like I have the skills to fulfill this position. I do realize that I can only hold one position. Um, I had originally intended to uh, continue serving as CD2 um, as I enjoy that role. Um, however, I am also aware of, of the absence of the treasurer and that is an important role and I'm trying to go where the work is. So um, I ask for your vote and I will follow the membership guidance uh, according to how membership votes and uh, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. <clears throat> Next, we have Mike McAllister. Hi, uh, I'm Mike McAllister. Uh, I am running for uh, one moment here. Uh, running for recording secretary. Uh, uh, Re-election as a member of the National Committee and also for an at-large seat uh, on the Coordinating Council. I've uh, been an active member of the Greater Milwaukee Green Party since 2009 and currently serve as co-chair. Uh, I was previously uh, State Party Secretary in 2016. Uh, in addition, I've been uh, uh, on the State Coordinating Council for the last several years. A uh, professional writer by trade, wearing the hats at different times of journalist, magazine writer, book author, and technical writer. I take good notes. <laughs> uh, but mostly I want to talk about the National Committee seat. Uh, I've been serving on the National Committee uh, either as alternate or delegate since 2019. Uh, I've been a socialist for the last 50 years. Uh, I want to talk about two uh, votes that I've taken in the last couple of years uh, that seem the most controversial. I voted to disaffiliate the former George, Georgia Green Party for one simple reason. I firmly believe that transgender people are indeed people and have the same human rights that I do. Greens need to be at the forefront of the movement to defend their human rights. I sometimes try to crystallize what I mean by this by simply noting that Chelsea Manning is a hero. I'm also a firm believer in the, in the right of oppressed peoples and nations to self-determination. This is true whether we talk about Palestine, Puerto Rico, or Ukraine. Uh, most people on the National Committee and perhaps as the part in the party as a whole may not disagree with may not agree with me about Ukraine, but I don't want to waste time denouncing them about it. We have a party to build. The way we build this party is by standing with the people the corporate parties ignore, the people of color who need not just their right to vote, but the right to justice. The auto workers on the picket line looking for a just transition from the fossil fuel era, the immigrants seeking a better life free from corporate exploitation, the young people who need a vision of the future that doesn't look like a dystopian novel. The world's depending on us. Let's get moving. I would appreciate your vote. Thank yes. you, Mike. Okay, um, moving along. Uh, the next individual that we have is Bruce Hinkforth. Uh, Bruce, would you like to make a comment? I will ask, I'll send the unmute request uh, in case you do. Okay, I'm uh, <laughs> muted. Let me get my picture up there.
Okay, I have been Recording Sector Secretary of Green Party many times over the 35 years I've been in this party. Uh, and I took copious notes and made sure they got published. Uh, one of my concerns right now is that according to council is in violation of several requirements in terms of communications. In section three of, uh, oh, I think it's under the coordinating council, whatever article that is, it says all policy and financial decisions and resolutions shall be published in the organization's newsletter. We don't do that at all. None of the previous secretaries have done that of late. Uh, I haven't seen anything in a newsletter publishes the decisions of the coordinating council. That needs to be done. We need more communication between the members. Also, uh, the recording of the membership meetings, I think is kind of scanty, really. They don't, I mean, I made a motion and uh, caveat I attached to that was not recorded in the spring meetings, as I explained earlier. Um, and on top of that, notices of meetings of the coordinating council have, uh, are supposed to be accessible to the membership. The membership needs to know when there's a coordinating council meeting. They also have the right, mentioned twice in our bylaws, to be present and participate in any and all meetings, whether it's membership, committee meetings, coordinating council, whatever. And, um, that doesn't happen either, you know. We need an openness. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I would like to be secretary. And I'm, uh, I'm retired now and I have plenty of time to uh, take my copi copious notes and, and turn them into decent minutes, minutes that uh, explain maybe more than just the actual decisions that are made. I think people need to know uh, some of the thoughts that went into the various decisions made by the coordinating council and other committees for that matter. So I would like to uh, be secretary again, but I'd also simply like to be on the coordinating council again, either as the fifth district representative or as an at-large representative. I think uh, we need a bit more diversity of opinion on the coordinating council. And we need a larger coordinating council. I mean, we got like, what, six members now? I just, <clears throat> we have the, the potential here for 15 or 20 with the at-large members and caucus members and stuff like that. We need a larger share, larger number of people on the coordinating council for the sake of diversity. And also we just need more people to serve on committees. We got the same people serving on, on all these different committees that we have. And that's just, too much, for one thing, it's too much of a workload. People shouldn't have to serve on three or four committees in order to get stuff done. And some of these committees are just basically inactive because there's just not enough people to go around. And I, and I think the coordinating council should seek out through the membership uh, for other people to join these committees who aren't necessarily part of the coordinating council. <clears throat> that requires communication, which I don't know. I saw this thing at the bottom of the uh, agenda today about this decision-making list. Well, it's news to me. I've never seen that. I don't know where it came from. I asked for it last spring, but it was never announced on, on the website. And I just kind of found it by accident today. So. Otherwise, I would have been happy to discuss a lot of these issues that we're talking about today since the last spring meeting. So, I ask for your vote. That's it. Thanks, Bruce. All right. Um, next, we have James Bankard. Uh, James, would you like to make a comment? I'll send the unmute request just in case. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm running for correspondence secretary. Um, and I live in Madison, where I believe the PO box is. So I think I could be responsible in picking up mail, responding to inquiries. Um, and I've been a social worker and a substance use counselor in Madison for most of the past 20 years. Been voting for the Green Party for 20 years as well. Um, obviously, been a rocky first year for me here at this party. And given what Dave, who I believe is running for this office, said this morning uh, in an email, he said that uh, I have not shown the slightest interest in any other topic raised in four like screen party meetings and that I haven't done any work for the party. You know, Dave's got a point, you know, and, and I, uh, I, I wish I could be more involved and this year has been divisive enough that it's been difficult for me to be involved because I haven't known when it's okay to speak my mind about this. Dave accuses me of, be of being right wing. That would be news to my family. Uh, I've, I've never been accused of being that. I believe in freedom of expression. I believe in freedom of uh, expression. And there are a lot of organizations and, um, you know, workplaces that have trusted me. So uh, I wouldn't be in this meeting if I wasn't committed to the Green Party and trying to make it work. Um, so I hope that you guys can consider, there is language in the bylaws about every reasonable effort can be made to rotate the co-chairs. That language doesn't extend to other offices as well. But I think, you know, given what Bruce just said about diversity of viewpoints within leadership positions, I echo that language. I also will echo what um, Joe Nathan said about encouraging people to get involved in committees. I was involved in the membership committee and with the blow up that happened with the Rage Against the War Machine rally that um, I was kicked off that committee. So, you know, we've talked about all that and it was voted down to be discussed here. So, and I respect that vote. So, um, in any case, uh, I'm here, I'm willing to work, as I said in February when we had our winter gathering then. And I've been hesitant to speak my mind because I don't know when I'm, apparently I don't know when I'm being inappropriate. <laughs> I just want to get to work and help the party however I can. So that's what I'm, that's what I have to say. And I uh, appreciate you guys listening. Thanks. Thanks, James. Uh, so next we have Dave Schwab. Go ahead, Dave. Hey, everyone. I'm, uh, you know, I already uh, got a chance to say my piece at the beginning of this meeting, so I won't take too long. Um, you know, again, again, I'll be joining the, I have joined the Jill Stein campaign as communications director. Um, but, you know, of course, I'm still uh, totally committed to the ongoing success and growth of the Wisconsin Green Party. Um, and, you know, because my comrades have asked me to uh, continue serving the party, um, you know, I, I can't say no to, uh, to people who have done so much for the party. So, um, yeah, so I, uh, self-nominated for correspondence secretary. Um, I'm in Madison and that's something that I can uh, easily handle, um, and have before and also for at large representative of the coordinating council. Um, I, you know, I won't have as much time, uh, for the Wisconsin green party in this coming year. As I have had in the past, but again, I'm still totally committed, um, and you know, really excited to be working with uh, such great people. So, thanks. Pass. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Uh, next, we have Kurt Bolton. Uh, Kurt, would you like to make a comment? Okay. I sent the unmute request to Rita Maniotis.
I'll send it again. Okay, it doesn't look like they are unmuting. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, sorry about the technical snafu. Uh, Kurt Bolton, I haven't been with the Green Party as long as a lot of other people. I have been the recording secretary. Um, I believe the Green, Green Party has a lot of challenges. I don't know that I have all the answers and I think it's important to get the membership involved. So uh, that being said, uh, I'd love to be of service to the Green Party. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Okay, um, next we have Michael, Michael White. Uh, Michael, would you like to make a comment? I will send the unmute request to you now. Voila, thank you. Um, as many of, but not all of you know, I was uh, briefly co-chair of the party some years ago. Um, I worked hard on Jill Stein's campaign. I came into the Green Party largely because uh, I know Jill personally. We both trained in Boston and she reached out to me and asked me to become involved. As a result of that, I was also on the national committee for a little while. I'm running for uh, co-chair or uh, uh, coordinating council rep from district three currently on a post um, I would like to serve on the national committee if if we if there's value in my being there there's actually five people running now so um, you actually have more than one choice um, I'm going to make a couple of inflammatory statements uh, not directed at anybody but at the national level and the state level the green party has been ineffective, ignored, um, irrelevant, and inconsequential. And that is despite the fact, as you heard from Dr. Borello, um, your children and grandchildren are screwed by climate change. Um, and we have not drawn the attention that we should have on issues of climate change and uh, ecocide, not to belittle any of the other issues on equality um, and fairness and inclusion and everything else, because I hold to the same green values as everybody else, but the survival of the species is at stake. I have been watching the scientific background on a lot of these issues for a long time, and it just keeps um, getting worse and worse. What I propose to do to the best of my ability as I did when I was running for governor in 2018, is get these issues in front of all of the Trump voters where I live and all of the Democrats where I live and get us working with, not just disrespectful of uh, the moderates and the other parties, because if we don't do something now, um, the survival of the species is at risk. So I'm asking for your vote. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Pass. Thank you, Michael. All right. Um, moving along, it looks like we have Sam Michael uh, up next. Is is Sam um, one of the folks that is um, with the uh, group with uh, Rita? Okay. I will... On the unmute quest, under the assumption that he will want to, or that they'll want to make a comment. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Sit, sit down. 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 I'm running because one of the reasons why I'm in the Green Party is because of the issue of climate change. I think it's first and foremost. 
Uh, and I think that in the Green Party, we need to help expand the Conservation Congress. Um, I know that we have three members in there, which is fantastic, but I'm hoping we can get more in there. I'm planning to run. Uh, and I think that once we expand members in the Conservation Congress, we're going to be able to help uh, get members to the state level and national, et cetera. Um, but I think that it's important, uh, not just for the survival of uh, the species, not just for the survival of man, but uh, to help gain recognition and uh, to help gain our status. Um, so that's basically why I'm running. Thanks. Sorry if I was off screen. But that's why I'm running. Uh, I've been involved with the Milwaukee Green Party. I've been involved with collecting some signatures for uh, the Cheryl McFarland, uh, Michael White. Um, and yeah, I, that's just kind of what I'm at, what I'm at my, my ideology. Uh, and it's a pleasure working with you guys. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next, we have Josh. Anderson. Uh, Josh, would you like to speak? And I'll send Josh the unmute request. Hi, my name is Josh. I've been with the Green Party since 2016. Um, basically, the reason I would like to run, I'm running for CD4 and for an at-large delegate. Um, I think there's been a lot of issues within the party. There's been issues with uh, issues with a lot of vitriol being thrown around, a lot of issues with transparency. I think really what we need to do is um, reconcile the party. We are too small of a party to be as divided as we are whether that's on a national level or a state level. I think most of the things we can agree on as far as climate change, being anti-war, um, I, I think those are things we should work on as a party uh, together, join forces. I think uh, another thing that I think we really need to work on is coalition building. We are not gonna do this by ourselves. And if we keep um, not wanting to work with other people, um, I think that's gonna be the downfall of this party. As, as you can see, I think there's been um, a, a big movement away. You know, the party ebbs and flows through the years, but I think the one thing that we need to do is learn to work well with others. So that's things that I would like to do. I'd like to be more transparent. We need to think about our processes. Um, you know, processes are there for a reason. Bylaws are there for a reason. I think, you know, if, if we continue to violate them, I, I think that's going to be... Um, a bad thing for the party. So those are things that I will pledge to work on um, if I'm elected to the CC. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Um, next, uh, we will go to Jeff Reese. Uh, Jeff, would you like to make a comment? I'll send you the unmute in case you do. Okay. Um, my name is Jeff Reese. I'm with the sixth district. Uh, which is active members in this part of the state. Uh, I would like to try to change that. Uh, I've been with the Green Party now for about seven years. Uh, I joined in 2016. And uh, that was really kind of a pivotal year um, in terms of presidential politics. Uh, right now, we, we desperately need uh, a Green Party, or we really need a independent party that uh, speaks for, well, uh, doesn't seem to have a voice anymore. Um, Maybe even more than that. Um, I'm uh, active in the uh, citizens' climate. I'm uh, interested in uh, doing something to promote, get more trains running. Uh, the uh, the Amtrak system is is. Um, 
absolutely in horrible shape. So uh, um, I think that the Greens, uh, if they're really committed to doing something about the environment, this is the time to get together and let's do something. So um, I'm hoping that I can uh, recruit a few people in this 11 county region to help me out and let's let's get get things going and, and uh, you know grow this party green and growing thank you I'll pass thank you Jeff um, so there were some audio issues um, I would like to just um, extend the offer uh, if you want to send us an email uh, at the email address that I'm providing in the chat um, to provide a cleaner um, version of your comments, um, please feel free to do so, and we will um, include that with uh, the materials that we send out to the uh, full party membership after this meeting. Okay, um, so next we have Joe Nathan Kingfisher. Uh, Joe Nathan, if you want to make a comment, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hello, everybody. You know, greetings, Buju Anin. Uh, my name is Joe Nathan. That's my first name. It's uh, it's from my dad, George, Joe for George, and my dad's dad's dad, Nathan. And they shorten it from Joe, <laughs> George Nathan to Joe Nathan. So uh, Joe will work just fine. Uh, my middle name is my Ojibwe name. My real name is Z. Beeson, lots of little rivers. And my last name is Kingfisher for the Kingfisher bird. That's my family bird from the Sandhill Crane, Ajijak. Um, well, here, I'm here in Ashland, Wisconsin. I've been involved with the Green Party for 25 years, going back to uh, Nader Leduc uh, campaign, and I have served as co-chair for two years. So there's lots of recordings on uh, my political administrative legacy, uh, and I've, I've appreciated being able to represent. Uh, I'm if there's one position I'm most interested in, I would really like I would really like to be a national delegate to meet more Green Party members and to represent at a larger level. Uh, I, I've uh, got that appreciation. I'm also going for, I guess, District 7, uh, Ashland area uh, representative. And uh, yes, I, I greatly appreciate everybody's attendance and uh, patience with each other and uh, appreciation of the speakers. And that, yeah, I, I studied earth system science at Michigan State after Alma College at the graduate level. And um, the, <laughs> oh, uh, I, I don't know if I, I I'm, I'm, I'm in between laughing and crying, thinking about half of all life, half of all species already having perished. That's what he said. We're half with the cliffs way back there. The train has gone off the cliff. The cliff's back there with all the species. Now they're half gone or something. That's what he said. So it's difficult times. And yeah, we got an urgent message. And I'd like to represent. So that's my piece. Pass. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Tiffany Anderson. Tiffany, would you like to make a comment? I will send the unmute request now. Seeing a comment in the chat from Josh saying Tiff is working, so she may not be able to speak. I could say something on her behalf. Um, I think that would probably be allowable if uh, assuming that Tiffany is okay with that. Um, also, as Sam said, uh, you could certainly submit a written statement, although I understand given the time issue, it may be difficult to write something. Um, 
you know, she's working during this meeting. So I, yeah, I think, uh, Josh, uh, can probably be empowered to speak for Tiffany. Um, okay. Well, I'll send Josh, uh, the unmute request. Thanks for letting me speak on her behalf. Um, I would just like to say she was a former Lieutenant, uh, gubernatorial candidate. Uh, she's worked very hard for the party, got a lot of signatures, uh, very hard worker. I, I would, um, I'm a little biased being her brother, but I think she would be a really great addition to the CC. Very organized and very thoughtful. Pass. Thank you. Uh, so I see that next we have Emerson, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, Emerson, are you still with us? I'm not seeing Emerson in the participant list. Um, I can try real quick to contact Emerson. Uh, but yeah, we should probably go to the next person. Okay. Yeah, the next person is uh, Michelle, who it also looks like is not here. So I'm just going to go ahead and move to Chester Todd. Michelle had rejoined. Is that... Uh, she... Yeah, Michelle is in the meeting. Oh, yeah. oh yes, she is. Okay. Sorry about that, Michelle. So right, I'll contact unmute. Emerson. Yep, I'm here. Um, sorry about the um, brevity of this, just because I'm, this is kind of a weird day for me. Um, hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I want to be more involved. I want to give more of my time. Um, reason being, I think there's um, a lot of op more opportunity for collaboration and, um, again, building the coalitions like many others have said. Um, and I've seen that example. Um, I've seen that example in the past from the Green Party, and I would really like to see more of it. Um, that's all I'm going to say. I'll pass. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next we have Chester Todd. Um, Chester, if you'd like to speak, I'm sending you an unmute request now. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Chester Todd. I'm relatively new to the Green Party, although I have kept abreast uh, on the uh, emails and stuff. I voted uh, for Howie and Nicole. Uh, I wrote them in. I live in the southeastern corner, uh, Racine. Uh, I live in Racine. I'm interested in uh, sitting on the council uh, as a representative for CD1 and uh, at large position. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, until we get Emerson back, um, I'm the uh, next up to speak uh, and potentially the uh, last speaker. Um, so I did submit a written statement. Um, I'll just read that briefly um, as well as posting it into the chat. I had a tag just to provide the written statement in the chat, but since uh, we want to give Emerson a little bit more time to rejoin, I'll read it out. Uh, I am running for National Committee uh, Delegate slash Alternate. I have served in this role for two years, and during that time, I have been uh, the most active member of the Wisconsin delegation uh, to the Green Party of the United States National Committee in terms of uh, engagement with topics up for discussion and vote. So in terms of, you know, providing email comments during the discussion period, um, and then also uh, again, the votes going. Um, I have regularly coordinated discussions amongst 
the other members of the Wisconsin Green Party delegation and have worked to ensure that proposals are discussed and voted on consistently. I have been nominated and approved twice for the position of Green Party United States National Committee Forum Manager, which is a position of significant trust in the National Party. Most recently in September of this year by a vote of 76 yes, three no, eight abstain. If re-elected as National Committee delegate slash alternate, I intend to utilize the Wisconsin Green Party decision-making list and the new online voting procedures to provide reports on and seek input on National Committee proposals directly from the Wisconsin Green Party membership. Uh, so my intention um, for the next year, if I am re-elected into the position is to increase transparency and allow direct input from the Wisconsin Green Party membership um, on the uh, National Party uh, proposals, National Committee proposals, um, and then to leverage the online voting procedures uh, that we have uh, in the bylaw amendments um, to, you know, essentially just allow the membership uh, the means to discuss these issues amongst themselves and to provide direct bonafide input to the National Committee delegation so that our actions on the National Committee are reflective of the will of the Wisconsin Green Party membership. Uh, I believe uh, in that purpose deeply. Uh, the The definition of a delegate is, is an individual who takes the um, decisions of their constituency, and then they enact those decisions, um, uh, you know, in in the context that they've been appointed to, um, which is different than a representative, uh, where um, one is empowered uh, to to make those decisions on behalf of of their constituency. So I'd really like to to move in the direction of more um, direct democracy uh, in terms of how the state party interfaces with the, with the national party. Uh, so obviously that went a little bit uh, outside of my Ren statement, but um, I hope that helps uh, inform folks about um, my plans and uh, reasoning for, for seeking the role. Um, uh, so Dave, were you able to get in contact with Emerson? Um, I've, I've reached out to Emerson. I attempted to call, I sent a text message. Um, I have not heard anything back yet. Uh, so hopefully Emerson will be able to rejoin. Um, I could I, call, I, I might know where he's at. I could call, I'll make okay. a phone call. Pass. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks, John Nathan. Um, but yeah, so hopefully Emerson can rejoin uh, shortly. Uh, I just want to make sure here that we have heard, you know, from all candidates. Uh, and I believe we have, uh, with the one exception of Emerson. Um, I'm going to leave the meeting and call him and come back into the meeting. Okay. Yeah. And another, another thing that's been raised, because I know we're already over time, is that Emerson could email a statement to us as well. And it could be included on the candidate information page. So hopefully Emerson can rejoin. But I think given that we're over time, I would like to um, start the discussion portion. Because, you know, as we said, every member will get their time to share their thoughts about the elections. Um, and yeah, so, and, and again, we have up to three minutes per person. We know there's, there's a lot going on, but, um, but yeah, you know, again, we have an email discussion list. If, if people, you know, have more questions, discussion, things that they want to talk about, but, you know, we did want to open up the floor to everyone now. Okay. So. We'll see if Joe Nathan is able to reach Emerson. Um, if not, then I'll put myself on stack um, to start off. And, you know, if other people want to get on stack, um, 
So, and I see there's some procedural questions in the chat. Anyway, um, you know, I will, I will uh, take my time now. So, Melissa, if you want to, uh, if you want to help out with the timekeeping, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay. Um, yeah, as as folks know, uh, I've been involved with the Wisconsin Green Party for a long time now. Uh, I moved to Madison in 2012 and, um, you know, helped to rejuvenate the party uh, in my first year here. Uh, so I, you know, have a lot of experience in the Green Party and in the National Party as well. I've worked on uh, all three of Jill Stein's presidential campaigns, Lisa Savage for Senate campaign, the Matt Ho for Senate campaign, um, as well as many, many local campaigns, uh, state campaigns, you know, from Michael White and Tiffany Anderson. Uh, anyway, uh, we know all this, but I wanted to say a few words about some of the candidates. Um, I will absolutely be voting for AJ for co-chair. AJ is a dedicated Green with many skills and has already been doing really valuable work with the Wisconsin Green Party. Um, I will not be voting for Rita Maniotis. Uh, the you know Rita's first significant interaction with, with the Wisconsin Green Party was to uh, attempt to use her Illinois Green Party credentials in order to nominate herself for Wisconsin Green Party position. And then when she was informed that this was inappropriate, you know she then refused to go through our process. We ended up you know voting not to nominate her for that position. Um, you know also her anti-trans and COVID politics are extremely out of step with our members. And, you know, we need ethical leadership with good political judgment. Um, absolutely yes to Melissa as treasurer. Melissa has done amazing work uh, despite constant unfair attacks from some quarters. And uh, I can't say enough about what, how valuable Melissa is to the Green Party. Uh, yes to Mike McAllister because Everybody loves Mike McAllister. Um, I will not be voting for Bruce. Uh, you know, uh, Bruce's reactionary politics are not a good fit for today's Green Party. He's anti-trans and he constantly talks about wanting to move the party to the right. Uh, Bruce is incredibly obstructionist and he tries to manipulate rules to block any action that he doesn't personally approve of. For example, at the spring gathering, Bruce said that we should defer the decision on bylaws to the fall, which we did. And today, Bruce wanted to table the decision until next spring. Um, and I could go on and on about, you know, Bruce has constantly complained and spread negativity in every single uh, membership meeting that he comes to without doing any productive work for the party uh, in the entire time that I've lived in Wisconsin. Um, I will also not be voting for James Bankard for anything. Uh, James has done nothing for the party since he joined, except seek conflict and spread division. And folks can see my email for more details about that. But, you know, even James claims to be anti-war, but he's shown zero interest in local anti-war actions or anything aside from his obsession with rage against the war machine. Um, so James has not been a productive member. Um, I'm, uh, Dave, you're at time. Okay, I'll put the rest of my comments in the chat. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, next we have Rita. So I will set the request to unmute. Okay, I have sent the request uh, twice. I'll just say um, the folks are on stack, please be prepared to, to um, accept the unmute request. Uh, 
Finally. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't understand how people can lodge uh, do name calling. I thought that was against the code of conduct. Um, first of all, I believe that if you call somebody a label like that, you have to have some proof because I have never been called that before. Um, I was living with a person who's transgender, so I'm not anti-trans. I work at a school where one of the teachers is trans and we work get along very well together. I don't, I don't see how you can name call somebody and just have that accepted as real. Um, I would not name call anybody. I think that everybody is a volunteer here and we need to foster our volunteers. We all do all of this work for nothing. We do this work for nothing. I've collected, I collected 4,000 signatures for Jill Stein the last time she ran. That hurt my feet, but I did it for nothing. All right, because I want to see the Green Party grow. So I, I would beg of you, please do not name call people. We are all here for best intentions. You too, Dave, I realize that you want to, the, the Green Party to grow. So please don't talk badly about anybody in this party who has worked their butt off to try to see this place, to see this party grow. So that's, I just had to say something because um, that's, that's kind of outrageous. I thought it was against the code of conduct. Thank you. Sam, are you facilitating? Uh, yes, um, I am looking in the chat, but um, I, I'm not seeing anybody on stack after Rita. Okay, looks like we have James on stack. I just real quick. Um... As far as my not being productive, I think I covered a lot of that in my um, uh, candidate statement. I'd like to be more productive. I've tried to be productive in the membership committee, and I'm sorry if I took a misstep. I already apologize for that. I'd like to get back to work. Um, I'd like to be correspondence secretary. Another thing that I didn't point out in my speech is that I invited um, every member of the existing coordinating council out for coffee just to say hi. And everyone said no. So as far as, I mean, I'm an in-person guy. I, I offered months ago to have in-person meetings in Madison that never went anywhere. Um, you know, it's so I, uh, and that, so I, I just thought that's important. I, that offer still stands, you know, if anyone wants to go out to coffee with me, I'm happy to explain myself. I'm happy to explain my passion for this party, for getting things done and bridging the divides. Um, I don't want to contribute to those divides. I want to try to heal them. Thank you. James. Uh, next, we have Melissa on stack. Thanks, Sam. Uh, firstly, I really appreciate Dave's endorsement for me. Uh, as a, I, I have been attacked by several people in the party that have been hostile towards me and uh, it's been difficult at times, but I do truly believe in uh, the Green Party. And I believe in the platform and the values and I strive to uphold those values and uh, operate in accordance with the code of conduct. And I, I hope to continue. Um, I just wanted to jump on and say that uh, speaking to James, I, I would not feel comfortable with him serving on the CC in any capacity. Um, he joined the membership committee after he uh, joined the Green Party membership. And the very first thing he did was misuse his credentials, uh, engaging in external communication with, with other individuals outside of the organization. And uh, that's a serious ethical issue that um, it doesn't, there hasn't been really a real sense of accountability for uh, the type of breach that is. 
Um, similarly with Rita Maniotis, uh, Rita joined the party and immediately used her Illinois delegate credentials, which were invalid, and used them to gain access to an area uh, that non-delegates don't have access to, and used her Illinois delegate uh, delegate credentials to nominate herself to represent Wisconsin. Um, all of this without consulting uh, the Wisconsin uh, CC. Um, and so those types of actions concern me and there's been uh, no accountability for that. And the lack of accountability of folks who have been engaging in destructive and harmful behaviors and violations of the code of conduct is the source of a lot of the problems we've experienced this year. Um, and we need to be upholding our code of conduct and we need to be uh, behaving ethically and respectfully past. Thank you. Um, okay, it looks like next we have Bruce. I'll send him the request. And I'll just mention quick, um, 4 p.m. Uh, is going to be a hard stop since that will be 55 minutes um, over the scheduled end time. I've, I've sent Bruce an unmute request. Okay. I too am very disappointed with David's name calling. I'm not a reactionary, although for years now I have been trying to promote the idea that as a party we need to build a majority. We don't do that by being so strictly ideological as this party has been lately. I've asked repeatedly that people to consider what the real concerns are of most Americans. It, it's pretty easy to find that, lots of polling on it. Right now it's probably uh, inflation, uh, border, and uh, military issues. A lot of the other things that we promote are way down that list. You know, I mean, we might feel real good about doing it, but we ain't getting any votes, folks. We're not attracting a broad enough spectrum of people to actually build a majority. And that's what we do have to do. That's what any political party has to do. And name calling and uh, you know, kicking people out of the party, that's just stupid. Okay, it's just stupid. This party needs to get its act together. We got a campaign to run the year from now, an election, and we ain't gonna do it with, uh, I mean, we've gotten some new members lately, probably because of Jill Stein's announcement, but we need a lot more than that. We need a lot more than that. And we need a lot more candidates too. You only need 200 signatures to get on the ballot for the state assembly, 400 for the Senate. We ain't do now. That's another part of what the, the party has to do. We need to build locals. We used to have eight or nine of them. Now we got just two. So, you know, there's a lot of things we gotta do and main calling and putting people down ain't one of them. <laughs> Uh, next on back, I believe we have Joan, uh, Joan Nathan. Uh, one second, Joan Nathan. Can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to mention, I mean, one of my administrative legacies was that the Green Party shall not be sustainable colonialism. And then one of my administrative legacies was separation of church and state. And 
people might not realize that the one of the main reasons that exists is so the churches don't fight. The church wars are pretty bad. So um, it's really important. Um, I've been calling, you know, living under religious extremist terrorist fascist violence is difficult and uh the afghanistan republicans and the american taliban are ruling us and it's very difficult to think about getting elected to a mafia mob criminal organization yeah here we are doing that so um i have got to bail for time and domestic demands and i appreciate everybody so much Thank you for your diversity of opinions. And please, yes, talk nice to each other and of each other and of the party. And thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, looks like we have Marita on stack again. So I will ask her to unmute. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken because we only have eight minutes left? Okay, it's my turn. I just wanted to, um, uh, there's, I think, something really important that we haven't done. And that is that Cheryl, here, I'll turn on the video. Um, Cheryl McFarlane has done an enormous service to this party. We do not have to collect one signature in this state to get Jill Stein or whoever is our nominee on the ballot. In, in Illinois, we'll have to get 50,000 signatures. So Cheryl McFarland deserves a huge, a huge award from this party. And I think that we should award her with like five years of membership or some award for her because she is in dire straits right now. Um, she can only like uh, drive from six to noon uh, doing Uber. Um, she has not been able to find another job and she lost the job just because she ran. The, the Democrats threw her out of her job because she was running for office as a Green. So I think we really need to give Cheryl McFarland some sort of award because she deserves it so much and I'll pass. Okay, look. Um... Like we have Josh Anderson on stack, so I will send the unmute request. And uh, just if any folks who haven't spoken um, would like to get on stack, we are nearing the end of time, so please um, put in your request quickly. Go ahead, Josh. I'll keep this brief. I I, I have to say I am a little disappointed at some of the the characterizations of other members. And I, I, I just want to try and keep this above board. Like, you know, instead of attacking each other, we can lift up other members, you know, running. And I, I really don't like to see that. You know, I've had positive experiences with a lot of people on this call, um, including some that were were put down. I, I've been reached out to by lots of them. Bruce has been a longtime member of, of the Green Party. I, you know, I think, you know, he's somebody, you know, we're all people, we all have different characteristics that sometimes can be hard to deal with. But I think, you know, we're all passionate, we all care about this. And I would just make a plea to everyone to please stop with those personal attacks, please stop with with that, you know, we can criticize um, processes and policies, but I really don't want to see um, those attacks become personal. And that's, that's my opinion, and that's what I would urge everyone to do: is stop, stop making so many personal attacks. Pass. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Um, not seeing anybody else on stack, so I will just put the um, offer out once again. Um, for folks to get on stack and provide um, comments or questions. Okay, uh, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, I want to make the point that open political discussion can be uncomfortable, but it's critically important when we're electing people who are empowered to make decisions for the party. 
And unfortunately, uh, the Green Party has not done a very good job of holding people accountable for misconduct. And there's a concerted effort to change that. And so I agree with, uh, you know, particularly many of the things that Josh has been saying um, in terms of working together, uh, you know, respectfully and, um, you know, but also having open discussion. And, um, you know, so I want to make the point that, you know, I think um, going forward, we are working on making changes such as the email discussion list so that we can have this sort of open discussion and there's less of people going around with false and misleading narratives about what the Green Party is doing and you know how they're unfairly treating people when in fact we've been doing absolutely everything we can to make this an extremely ethical and high functioning organization that's welcoming and respectful to everybody. Um, so anyway, that might be my last word for today, but again, thanks everyone. I really appreciate your dedication and um, yeah, onward and upward. Thank you. Okay, it appears that uh, Rita is on stack once again. Um, so I will send her the request. Uh, please be mindful of time since we are coming up on 4 p.m. Uh, I just have to say that we have to um, officially vote on um, uh, voting this way online rather than using the bylaws that are present because the bylaws right now that stand say that we have to vote at this meeting. Even though you've been doing it because of COVID um, for the last two times, we have not formally um, decided to uh, bypass the bylaws and go to an online voting. And that needs to be done to make it official. Pass. So I move that we, that, uh, we stick with the bylaws and vote at this meeting. I believe that we already decided that we are going to uh, move to the online vote for these decisions with a uh, substantial uh, majority of uh, votes in favor. Yeah, I agree with Sam. Um, you know, again, the agenda was set out well ahead of time. People were noted, you know, notified of what the procedure would be. Um, and we're just following the precedent that has been set and supported for multiple years. Uh, so, you know, again, I see uh, an hour after the official adjournment of the meeting and after many people have already left and you know, as I said, many members who wanted to make it couldn't make it. Um, you know, this is more attempted obstructionism. Um, and I think it's time that we adjourn and, you know, give all our members the chance to weigh in on the decision. Pass. All right. Um, I'm going to second the motion to adjourn um, since we are substantially um over time at this point uh so can i get a uh, second on adjournment okay second that all right um so with that i just want to thank everybody for uh, being in attendance today uh please look forward to receiving uh ballots um, to vote on the bylaw changes as well as the internal elections. And um, with that, uh, everybody have a good rest of your day.